My mother died when I was 12 years old. It was the single most traumatic experience of my life, and I'd be lying if I said I've gotten over it. But that isn't what has affected me most lately. Whenever a parent dies, most people just talk about the death itself. There's a lot of how and when, but not a lot of then what happened. It is that lasting legacy of what happens afterwards that really marks you for life. As my dad had to pick up extra hours to make ends meet, I had to help take care of my sisters. At that age, I barely made my own bed. Now I had to cook and bug my sisters about taking their showers. My younger sisters were far more depressed than I was. I didn't have time to be depressed. I had stuff to do. So now, as an adult, I can kind of see that I got stuck in that rut. I'm still taking care of people. Maybe I'm afraid of what'll happen if I stop. Originally, I wanted to be a doctor, but we just couldn't afford that kind of education. I considered studying abroad, but my sisters still needed me long into their teenage years. Instead, I studied to become a nurse, which was the cheaper option. No less work though, just slightly cheaper. Once my sisters and I moved out, I got my own place and I bounced around various hospitals and nursery homes around the state. I've worked at a rehab clinic, an open clinic, and as an in-home nurse. All kinds of positions. I had eight different jobs all in all, changing back and forth between them as one closed and another opened. But it wasn't until a few years ago that I saw an opportunity for a stable job. The biggest hospital in my home area had an opening for a nurse in the maternity ward. Well, I hadn't worked there before. I knew most of the procedures around the LDR rooms and the NICU unit. Sorry, I'll stop with the abbreviations. I got my interview just days after the wanted ad went up. I was called in to talk with two of the nurses and one of the doctors. I could tell it was sort of rushed and it all seemed like a bit of a formality. By the way they acted, I figured they could really use the help right away especially Dr. Gellin, who never even sat down. She was asking me questions while still pacing around the room. Surprise, surprise, I got the job. Starting Monday, the following week, I got my first tour of the place. The first few weeks, I would mostly act as a helping hand while they figured out a more static position for me. In the meantime, I'd be moving from nurse to nurse, assisting them one by one, I didn't really have any responsibility of my own at first. The first few days I spent with Dr. Gellin, helping out in the LDR. I have pretty good bedside manners and several expecting mothers were happy to have me distract them from whatever they were going through. I also had to run a few tests, sit in on ultrasounds and help deliver some bad news. I don't want to go into details, but pregnancy isn't always this amazing beautiful thing. After a few days, I helped out in the reception, then at the emergency room, and so on and so on. After about a month of working there, I had been pretty much everywhere but the nursery. You know, the fancy room with the glass windows where newborns rest up. I'd seen it in passing once, but it was sort of off limits to newbies like me. There's a lot you must be aware of when working with someone that helpless. It was when I was assisting Nurse Rena that I finally took my first steps into the nursery. It was this large square room with several units lining the walls, well lit with cheerful colours. It was empty when we went in there, having been cleared out for a proper spring cleaning, so it was a bit airy. We usually have a half dozen or so in here at a time, said Rena, a few more around August and September. I was a bit distracted. I kept hearing this strange noise. You with me? She asked. What did I just say? Sorry, I sighed. There's this noise. There's going to be plenty of noise, she groaned. You better get used to it. No, it's like... It was hard to describe. It seemed to come from the center of the room. Some sort of machine noise. A broken vent. A thump. Some kind of machine, I continued. Focus, what did I say? Kaka ka chunk, kaka ka chunk, kaka ka chunk. 
It was there, somewhere in the middle of the room. But what was it? Sorry, I smiled. One more time. As we left the room, the noise stayed in the back of my mind. It felt familiar somehow. But from where? The following days, things were getting busy. About half the patients we received either had some sort of condition or were oddly particular about their care. One woman had a partner sing screaming some kind of poem, for example. They had to be escorted out of the room. Another woman refused to have a baby without a favourite plant on the bedside table. Never seen a blue sunflower before. Never saw the kid either, for that matter. I was the assisting Rena in the nursery, and I got the opportunity to spend some time alone in that room. Even days later, the sound persisted. It was low, more like a hum, but it was definitely there. Kakaka chunk, kakaka chunk. I thought it might be a heating issue, but I couldn't locate where it was coming from. I suspected the ceiling, but it had this strange echo to it that made it just as prominent near the floor. Strange. At one point, we had five kids in the nursery at the same time. Rena had the main responsibility, but she took me along every now and then just to quiz me and see how well I fared on my own. But now that there were little patients in there, she had no tolerance for mistakes or hesitation. One Friday night, as I was working the evening shift, I went into the nursery to roll out one of the children. Rena was already halfway down the hall, calling out to Dr. Gellin, so I had this short moment completely alone with all five kids. The lights were a bit dimmer, and at first I didn't notice anything, but after a few seconds I could hear that sound again. Kakaka chunk. Kakaka chung. Kakaka chung. But there was something else. As I looked around the room, I could see all the kids breathing in sync with the sound, little chests heaving up and down. Kakaka chung. I gently pushed one of the units, accidentally waking up my little patient. As she stirred, she let out a soft cry, and for a moment, my mind blanked. I was just standing there in the middle of the room, and it felt like I was about to do something, and the machine noise was louder than ever. The kids were stirring. Maybe they could hear it too? It started to bother me. I asked a whole bunch of staff about it, but no one seemed to have any idea of what I was even talking about. If anything, the nursery was the quietest room in the entire ward. It had to be. You don't want to wake the patients. So, when I started rambling about machine noises, they all sort of tuned out, even Dr. Gellin. Even after my time with Nurse Rena was up, I started coming back to the nursery every now and then, sometimes on my lunch break. I just stand there and listen, trying to find the source of the sound. That's actually how I got started on here. I even took to online. I started asking other medical professionals about what that noise could be, and no one had a clear idea. I tried recording it, but it just wouldn't stick. Also, it is generally frowned upon to stand with a cell phone in the nursery, recording what could be a video. Big no-no. I went back over and over again, and it actually landed me in a bit of trouble. I had a private meeting with Dr. Gellin, who tried their best to understand my strange fascination with the nursery. Finally, I had to agree to leave my phone in my locker. I didn't go back there for a long time, but it was inevitable. The nursery is somewhat central to the entire ward, and you have to actively avoid it to never pass it. One night, as I was passing the glass window, I stopped to listen. But that time, I had a good reason. There were four kids in there, and they were the first thing I heard, not the strange machine noise. The kids were crying, but they were crying in unison. Short bursts of screams. It was rhythmic in a way. I stopped to listen, and my mind immediately returned to the noise. I was sure that if I stepped inside, I'd hear the noise again. The kids. 
They were screaming in unison with a sound. I could feel it. And that was just the start. I could start feeling it, even at home. I get frustrated whenever I heard my washing machine, as it was out of sync with the sound that haunted the back of my mind. Kakakachung, kakakachung. Every rhythmic noise I heard just seemed off by comparison. It bothered me just how stuck that sound was, and I still had no idea what it was. And where had I heard it before? It came to a point where I sat up all night, listening to a four-hour recording of a construction site. Nothing. Nothing sounded like that goddamn machine. Kakakachung. At the end of a particularly long shift, as I was changing into my ordinary clothes, I started to listen to the hum of a fluorescent light in the bathroom. I could almost hear the rhythm of the electricity. And right there, behind my eyelids, was that rhythmic thumping again. I held my breath, and it felt like the sound was growing louder. I could feel my pulse going up. Why was I getting angry? Or was it fear? But it was real. The sound was real. The longer I closed my eyes, the clearer it was. With my eyes closed, I turned my head. The sound changed pitch. Kakaka chung. There, a direction where it was louder than ever, loud enough to change the beat of my heart. It was coming from the nursery. God damn it. I slammed my locker shut and hurried out. I had to get to the bottom of this. The sound was so prominent that I could just close my eyes and it'd be there. It was beating in rhythm with my heart. Kakaka chung. I didn't care about anyone seeing me. I had to find out what it was. As I burst into the nursery, the newborns woke up. There were seven of them in total. One by one, they started screaming. A steady, rhythmic scream. How had no one noticed this? How was I the only one? Kakaka chung. Scream. Kakaka chung. Scream. It wasn't a pain scream, more like a chant. This primal, instinctual grunt scream, almost melancholic. The sound grew louder, and my chest was pounding harder and harder. I thought I was having a heart attack. My fingers were aching, like someone was slowly turning my nerves counterclockwise. I didn't even realize it at first, but I was screaming too, to the rhythm of the grinding machine. I closed my eyes as hard as I could, trying to force the sound out of my head. Instead, it became clearer, and there, in the dark of my closed eyes, I could finally see. It was a strange feeling, looking around the room with closed eyes. There were lines of beetles on the floor, reaching from the unit of every newborn to a spot in the middle of the room. It was clear as day, despite the darkness of my closed eyes. Black and grey beetles marching to the rhythm of the machine, carrying little globs of white. And in the middle of the room, there was the source of the noise. From the side, it didn't look like much. It was sort of a pipe with a faint yellow shine. It was about three feet wide, positioned in the center of the room. Line after line of beetles dove into it, the little globs of white falling out of their mouths. Despite my body screaming for me to get away, to get out, to take a breath, I had to look. With my eyes closed, I crawled forward. I looked down the pipe. It is strange not being able to close your eyes to make something go away. When you watch a scary movie, you can turn away. You can hide behind a pillow. But looking down that pipe, there was nothing I could do. I couldn't turn away, and my eyes were already closed. It's hard to describe. It was deep, impossibly deep. Somewhere, miles below, there was a fire so bright that it burned my closed eyes. I could barely see it, shrouded behind hundreds of cogwheels, chains, live wires and steam pipes. I just stared, watching the little beetles tumble over the edge, bumping against the absurd machinery. I could hear the little clicks and clacks of their shells as they struck the moving parts. Kakaka chunk. 
Something was moving. Something organic. Something living. There were hands reaching towards me. Hands getting burned on steaming pipes. Getting mangled by cogwheels. But still, it kept coming upwards. I hadn't even realized that I'd stopped breathing. I'd held my breath for so long that I was getting lightheaded. I was being pulled away from the center of the room, away from the machine. Something pushed against my back, forcing air back into my lungs. There was a distant voice. Two people were carrying me. My eyes opened, and I could see the nursery with my open eyes again. All seven kids were lying on the floor, outside of their units. They were screaming at the top of their lungs, just like me. They heard it. I heard it. But somehow, I think they knew more about it than I did. I was carried away. They tried to get me to breathe again, but it was like my body forgot how to do it. It wasn't until I got a mask over my face, forcing air into my mouth, that I snapped back to reality. My heart was hammering away so fast and hard that my head hurt. I had no feeling in my hands, and both my feet had fallen asleep. My face was burning hot. Dr. Gellin was shining a light in my eyes, but it felt so far away. For a split second, I blinked, and there, in the darkness, I sensed something. It was a different shade of dark. It had followed me here. It was so impossibly tall, able to cross the room in just a few steps. As it reached for me, beetles tumbled onto my chest, little globs of white getting ripped from my chest. Then, nothing. I must have passed out. They say it was some kind of psychotic episode. Hyperventilation, seizures. It didn't look good. I could no longer be around the children, so they were going to have to either fire me or find somewhere else for me to go. It took me two days to recover, and I was so scared to close my eyes that they had to give me eye drops. My hands cramped from grasping the side of the bed, terrified of being picked up or pulled away in the middle of the night. At times, I could almost feel the little beetles crawling over me, picking globs of shining white out of me. Sometimes, I felt the presence of something in the room. Even with closed eyes, I was scared to look. Some things can't be unseen. I was going to have a short interview with Dr. Gellin about the incident, but he was swamped that day. Instead, I got to talk to the chief physician, an older man who was a full head shorter than me. He asked me several questions about my medical history and my experience. He didn't really lead anywhere. That is, until we started rounding off the interview. As I read my social security number to him to make sure he had my insurance info, he stopped. Were you born in the area? He asked. I guess, I said. You can tell. The area number, he nodded. It's quite unique. There are three hospitals that cover that area, but two didn't have fully staffed maternity wards at the time you were born. Handing my papers back to me, he gave me a long look. You were born here, in this hospital, weren't you? He asked. I had no idea, but it made sense. Mom had lived in this town all her life. I just nodded. He didn't respond. Instead, he just looked at me and sighed. Without a word, the meeting ended. The following week, I lost my job. While one could think it was because of my psychotic meltdown, I'm pretty sure it was because of that meeting with the chief physician. I think he knows something. If I'd been born there, maybe I'd been in that room long, long ago, before I could even form memories. But if so, how could that noise sound so familiar? This was a few months ago, but I'm still looking for answers. That, and I think I'm going insane. I can still hear the click clacking of the little beetles falling to their deaths, and if I concentrate hard enough, I can hear the machine. Kakaka Chung. It's not a memory, it's always there. I think there's a piece of me down there, inside it still connected, something listening from the inside, something that 
hurts. Little globs of white. I don't know what to make of this. I just want it out of my head. Some days I can distract myself enough not to hear it, but other days I can barely hear myself talk. It's always there, no matter what. It's like a rhythmic, haunting tinnitus. But I know there's more to it. Sometimes, as I close my eyes, I can still see a faint glow in the distance. Sometimes, not even in the direction of the hospital. Sometimes, it's closer. Sometimes, it has eyes. But the sound is always the same. What started this whole ordeal is an issue that I'm sure that anyone who wears contacts or glasses can relate to. I've had the same eye prescription since I was 13 years old. It literally has not fluctuated once. Every year since my release, I've had to go through the same crap. It goes something like this. Take a day off from work, see the optometrist, have my eyes dilated, be told my prescription has not changed even a fraction of a point and then pray I survive the drive home with my weird, light-sensitive eyes. I usually end up getting a migraine from the dilation, so, overall, I consider my yearly eye exam to be an exasperating, painful occasion. I just don't know why I need to get my prescription renewed every year. Neither does my wallet. I'm working part-time, or at least that's what my contract says. I'm regularly pushing 50 hours a week so no insurance. This means that two months ago, when my prescription was up and my final contact ripped, I was dreading the bill for what I knew would culminate to useless experience. Then, I had a brilliant idea. I thought it'd be smart to order contacts online and skip my annual irritation. I checked the popular sites and, much to my displeasure, they either required an updated prescription or were substantially more expensive. I was about to give up after looking through the first five or six, but then I found a seller who seemed perfect. The AllSeeingEye.com They had my brand for about 20 bucks cheaper than I usually pay and advertised next day shipping. I'm usually not the type of guy who would have ordered something from an unknown website, but there was an option to purchase through PayPal. Thinking I didn't have much to lose, I clicked the big red buy button. I went to bed, feeling uneasy about my purchase. As soon as I'd bought it, I felt sure it was a scam and thought I had a few annoying calls to PayPal in my near future. The next morning, I got ready for work. I put in my one good contact and hoped that I wouldn't get a migraine from the missing one. When I went outside... There was a small cardboard box on the porch of my trailer. It was a little after 5am, much too early for the mail to have run. I picked up the box and thought maybe I'd missed the Amazon delivery the previous day. I threw it in the passenger seat of my car without giving it a second thought and sped off to work. I'm employed as a janitor at the local retirement home, Shady Oaks, and yes, it's literally named that. I haven't changed the name for privacy concerns or anything like that. The owner, never met the guy, just must be lacking in the imagination department. Anyway, it's pretty large by retirement home standards and advertises itself as a retirement community. Currently, there are about 500 residents, the majority of which are well over the age of 75. There's a decent percentage of live-ins in their 60s, plagued by the likes of dementia and Alzheimer's. But only a handful of patients are younger than that. All the younger ones either have debilitating mental illness or have suffered from some sort of trauma that has rendered them unable to live on their own. Of that group, I had only seen one resident at Shady Oaks younger than me. Her name was Anne, and she was only 20 years old when she got into a fatal car crash. A drunk driver swerved onto oncoming traffic, killing Anne's family her mother and her two younger sisters on impact. Anne, the sole survivor, told me how she listened as cars passed by the wreckage for what felt like hours. All she could see was blood and broken glass. She told me that her body, 
the thing she had thought was hers was suddenly unresponsive and alien. She tried to move, to pull herself from the wreckage, but her body wouldn't listen. It kept her locked in place. Anne told me that she felt like something else had taken control of her, that some force had possessed her and was forcing her to stay in place. Despite the vast disconnect between her body and mind, Anne told me she could feel everything. She could feel all those purple points of flaring pain, the glass embedded into her arms and legs, all the broken bones that caused the breath to come out in raspy, wet coughs. When the EMT finally arrived, reportedly 10 minutes after the crash, Anne said she could hear them saying that no one could have survived the crash. She tried to make a noise to alert them that she was there and needed help, but she couldn't. Each time she tried, she said all she could produce was a quiet gurgle as she choked on her own blood. Anne was sure she would die there. Thankfully, Anne survived, but she'd broken her neck. On top of becoming paralyzed, she'd also sustained a major concussion. Her life would never be the same. Anne's father was mostly out of the picture. I don't really know the whole story, but I know that he wasn't there for her during Anne's childhood. Her dad seemed to step up after the accident. Apparently, the way that the EMTs had removed her from the wreckage might have worsened her injury. He fought tooth and nail for Anne until the hospital agreed on a settlement. I don't know the exact number, but it was apparently a pretty decent sum. Anne's father used that money to put in Shady Oaks and then took off to God knows where. She hasn't heard from him in years. Anne is the main reason I've stayed employed so long at Shady Oaks. It's kind of ironic. When I first saw Anne six years ago, I was on the verge of quitting. And seeing her, so frail and small that I first thought she was a child, was nearly the final nail in the coffin to me turning in my resignation. Anne was a far cry from the usual residence I dealt with. Shady Oaks is separated into four buildings. The first is where the able-bodied seniors who need minimal care live. A lot of the residents here have their own cars, and they are free to come and go with some parameters. The second is where the residents with either minor physical disabilities or the preliminary stages of dementia or Alzheimer's live. The residents are still somewhat free to roam the building, but the doors to the outside stay locked. The third block I try to avoid. It's where the residents with severe, debilitating issues live. They are confined to their rooms. It's a sad sight to see. The fourth block is where I work. It is the smallest, around 25 residents, and it's where the old folks are sent when their minds are still solid, but their bodies are not. I've overheard a few past co-workers refer to us as the death block. It's a fitting name. This is where a lot of residents are moved to when they are standing on their last leg. We do have a few long-term residents, like Anne, who aren't quite at death's door, but they are rare cases. I don't mind working so close to death. In fact, I'm fairly certain that working in the fourth block is far better than the third. I try not to get attached to the old folks in the death block. They don't stay here long after all. Still, seeing Anne so young and here in the death block made me feel... I don't know, upset? Scared? Unsettled? All I can say is that it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel fair. It still doesn't. Anne was paralyzed, but she could still talk. When I would clean a room, she would ask me to turn the TV on and make polite conversation. She had her pronounced stutter from the accident, but I could tell how smart she was. I could see, even before I'd known her, that her body had become a cage that prevented her from moving or even communicating the way she wanted. It was excruciatingly difficult to be around her. Again, I'd already been on the verge of quitting, but for reasons I'll get into in a moment, I was worried about finding employment elsewhere. After a few weeks with Anne, I requested my manager move me. At first, it seemed like she was going to approve the request, but then I made the mistake of telling her why I wanted to be moved. 
Evidently, the fact that I was uncomfortable around a young, immobile girl meant I was perfect for the job. She said this with ease, and then callously joked about being worried about some of my co-workers. I was repulsed. The flippant way she could imply that about them, almost laughing, but with a sick certainty in her eyes disgusted me. I remember heading back to the death block after that meeting, eyeing each of my co-workers as I went. Which ones had she been talking about? I was sure that I would quit after that, but as I went online, looking for openings, this overwhelming feeling of anxiety settled like a dark cloud. The reason I felt so bleak isn't something I run around broadcasting, but it's pretty unavoidable in the context of employment. I'm... a felon. It doesn't matter if I've been on the straight and narrow for over seven years. It doesn't matter that I spent my youth, the entirety of my twenties behind bars. None of that matters. All prospective employers see is a little box checked yes, because a stupid 19-year-old version of myself caught a charge on account of possessing a Schedule 4 with intent to sell. And it's true. I'm not going to spin you some story about me being falsely convicted. My mom had passed away shortly before the events that led me to prison. I was cleaning out her stuff, found the whole bottles of Xanax. I was your average poor college kid and thought I would make a quick buck. Instead, I got 10 years. When I got out of prison, I was pushing 30 and the only place I could find to hire me was Shady Oaks. I wondered especially after talking with my manager, how many of my co-workers were in the same boat as me, how many were felons that accepted this minimum wage, demeaning janitorial job with no benefits because it was their only option. As a felon, it'd be kind of hypocritical to judge others for holding the same status. Still, I found myself watching my co-workers, wondering if they were violent, wondering if they would really hurt Anne in the way my manager had implied if given the chance. So, I stayed, and I would end up being thankful that I did. After that horrid conversation with my manager, I figured there was no avoiding Anne. I stopped being short with her. As I thought, Anne's mind was brilliant, though, through her broken body, there was a shine to her soul that could not be dampened. I found out about her life before the crash, all of her hobbies, what her dreams had been, you get the point. She came about a year after I started at Shady Oaks. I joked often that she was both the youngest and the oldest resident in the death block. It's been around six years now, and Anne has become my best friend. So that morning, the morning I'd found the box on my porch, I grabbed my cart and headed straight to Anne's room. This was the usual routine. She was asleep but I flicked the light on and sat down purposely heavy on the edge of the bed. She groaned, stuttering out my name. Who else? I asked her, lighting up a cigarette. Anne didn't smoke before she came to Shady Oaks, but, well, caught me a bad influence. I introduced her to one of the world's most uselessly expensive pastimes. She opened her mouth and I popped the cigarette in after taking a draw myself. She took a few shallow breaths, and then I took the cigarette back. You heard anything about my request? I was in a line of sight, so I shook my head. Sorry, Anne. She set her mouth into a tight frown. You see, Anne had been told as a kid to shoot for the stars, and she had taken that literally. Before her accident, she had been well on her way to a dual degree in astronomy and physics. In another life, I have no doubt Anne would have become a renowned astrophysicist, but in this one, the only one who would see her brilliance was me. Which was a waste, since I only understood half of a science talk, and that's on a good day. She had a sight set on a meteor shower a couple of months away, and had put in a request to be wheeled out to watch the sky. It was a weird request, but I thought it was manageable. The only issue I could really foresee was a shower being visible from 3am to 5am. Odd hours for a resident to ask for fresh air. But I'd hoped they would grant her this one thing since she rarely asked for much. 
after her initial disappointment had passed, we got to talking as usual. We smoked another cigarette, not really saying anything too substantial, until I remembered the box on my porch. I joked about my Amazon addiction, not even remembering what I'd ordered, and Anne had a strange look. You said you ordered... Contacts? She doesn't like when I finish the sentences, but I'd already been in the room for half an hour. If I stayed much longer, someone was bound to come searching. Well, yeah, but next day shipping isn't that fast. Anne rolled her eyes. Just saying. I'll come back on my lunch break and prove you wrong. So, with those words, I grabbed my cart and set out on my cleaning route. I went about my day until about noon, then clocked out, retrieving the box and my lunch, before going back to Anne's room. Interestingly, there was no shipping label on the cardboard. It was perfectly blank. I thought to myself as I walked to a room. After I'd prevented Anne, I started eating lunch with her as opposed to in my car. Eating with her is something I now realise I took for granted. Just having someone to talk to as you have a meal is not something you really think about until you don't have it anymore. Starting to think this is a prank, I told Anne as I grabbed the fold-out TV tray from behind the door. The box? I nodded, sitting at the edge of the bed. There's no shipping label, and someone really overdid it with the tape. Could be the neighborhood kids. Maybe they should have did bird in a box or something. That's your first thought? Trailer park kids are weird, man. I told her as I clawed at the tape on the box. Wow, they really didn't want me getting into this. Want me to help? She asked sarcastically. Finally, getting one of my short fingernails under the tape, I ripped it open. And out fell contacts. What is it? I groaned exaggeratedly. Well, you were right. It's my contacts. Still weird that it came so early and there's no shipping label. Trailer park kids? I just frowned and said, maybe. I examined the box, trying to see if there was any indication it had been tampered with. But the cardboard was smooth and unmarred. I knew from the tape that it had been sealed well. Well, whatever, I said, standing up. I'm going to put in the new lenses. I went into Anne's bathroom. Each of the rooms on death block had a small one attached, but of course, Anne's is perfectly clean. She can't really use it. I washed my hands in the sink and then tore open the box. The packaging looked exactly like my brand, as did the inside. I opened up one of the contacts and rubbed it between my forefinger and thumb. It felt the same. I looked into the mirror and popped the contact directly onto my pupil. Half expecting it to burn, my eyes were watering up. I glanced up, down, and then blinked to ensure the contact sat correctly. When I opened my eyes, I could see normally. I discarded my old contact into the sink and popped a fresh one into the other eye as well. I grinned at my reflection, thinking that I'd finally found a way to circumvent my annual eye exam. I left the bathroom to deliver the good news to Anne, but she wasn't there anymore. Especially after befriending her, my manager's words have echoed through my mind. I've always wondered about one of my co-workers sneaking in and hurting her. I mean, if I can spend hours in a room without anyone questioning or really even noticing, What's stopping someone with bad intentions from doing the same? Anne? I called her name. S scammed She replied at once, the sound of her voice emanating from her empty bed. When I looked closer, I could see the indentation of her head on the pillow, of the sheets wrinkling under the weight of something unseen. I took a step forward, and there Anne was. Her pale skin was translucent. I saw the white of the bed sheet more than I saw her. Being very eloquent with words, I said, Oh my god. I remember thinking, is this from the contacts? I mean, it had to be, right? One moment I see Anne normal, then I put in some new contacts and she suddenly goes transparent. Anne was starting to panic, 
asking questions that I vaguely registered to be about burning and blindness. She thought I hurt my eyes or something. I don't know why I didn't tell her what I saw. Maybe if I would have said something, I could have prevented what was coming. I saw the alarm in her near see-through face, and I felt the need to reassure her. I'm an only child, and I'm hardly eight years older than Anne, so it'd be weird to say she's like a sister or child to me. I don't really know what it would feel like to have either of those. Still, I've always felt a distinctly familiar bond with Anne. I don't want her to worry over me. There's this unfamiliar feeling of overprotectiveness that settles over me when I can see Anne frazzled. I felt it in this moment. I didn't tell Anne about her being see-through, but it wasn't just due to my need to quell Anne's anxiety. I also felt, from the pit of my stomach, that I absolutely was not supposed to tell anyone about the strange effect the contact had on my sight. Anne was staring at me. I made up something along the lines of, I just can't believe I didn't get scammed. These contacts work great. She made that face at me. The one where she scrunches up her nose and her mouth is drawn so tight her lips disappear. It's her way of calling BS. But she didn't say anything. It's really nothing, I said. Just happy I didn't get scammed. Her gaze burnt. I felt sweat drip down the nape of my neck. I shifted from one foot to the other. Anyway, you hungry? I brought some fast food for lunch that day. She smiled brightly as I shared some cold, greasy fries to her. To me, they tasted pretty bad, but I guess it's good in comparison to the mush she's used to. I'm not supposed to share food with residents, or really give them anything, but I do, and not just Anne. You might tell me I'm soft, when a raspy old woman saves from death, asks you to snag her some sugar-free butterscotch candies. Well... Why wouldn't I say yes? That's pretty doable as far as last requests go. So, after lunch, I went back to cleaning. As I did, I noticed that most of the other residents on the death block were in similar states of transparency as Anne. It all came to a head when I got to the last resident, Mr. Brown. He was a nice old guy who'd been on death block a little over a month. Telling stories was his thing, and I enjoyed listening. Mr. Brown's room appeared to be empty when I entered. He'd been in horrid health the day before, and when I'd seen the empty bed, I thought the worst. I began sweeping the corners until I heard somebody quietly pass gas. Sorry, boy, Mr. Brown's voice grumbled. I was trying to hold that in until after you left. I looked all around. No one else was in the room. Well, if it smells that bad... My attention was drawn to the bedside chair. There was an indentation in the fabric as if someone was sitting there. No need to look for an exit. Just open the window and come back after. There was a hacking cough. After it airs out. Sorry, sir, I said, looking at the chair. I just didn't see you there at first. You made a noise of understanding. Yeah, I'm wasting away. My arms ain't been this skinny since I was a boy. He coughed again. Son, he said shakily. This time, when he coughed, a spray of mucus red erupted from nowhere and painted the floor. I think I need a nurse. Immediately, I hit the button on the side of his bed and then sprinted to the front desk, grabbing the RN who was sitting there filing her nails. Later, I'd reflect on how every resident I'd seen that day were in various stages of transparency, but the nurses all seemed perfectly opaque i think about all that later, but that was the farthest thing from my mind in that moment. Mr. Brown was all I could think about. I dragged the nurse to Mr. Brown's room, explaining what happened as we went. When we got there, I could see the man again. He was face down in front of his chair. The nurse asked my assistant in turning him over. As soon as I saw his face, I knew he was gone. Those eyes weren't the eyes of Mr. Brown. His eyes were so black that you couldn't tell the pupil apart from the iris, but they sparkled with mirth. There was a crinkle to the crow's feet that lay beside them that told the story of Mr. Brown's life, of the hardships he had been forced and the joy he'd felt in spite of it. The person in front of me 
had dull black eyes, devoid of even the smallest glimmer, and his face was smooth, the wrinkles seemingly taken by death. Several more nurses ran in, pushing me out of the way as they worked to resuscitate him. I already knew the outcome. Mr. Brown was declared dead at 4.06. Death isn't uncommon here, so it's not like I got to go home early. I finished up my shift and stopped by Anne's room once again. I told her what had happened with Mr. Brown, leaving out the part where he'd been completely invisible. I'd give you a hug if I could, she said. I know you liked him. I nodded not telling her what I was actually concerned about. I nudged the hand with my pinky, half expected to face through her, but despite her translucent body, she still felt solid. Hang in there, I told her, not knowing why I said that. When I got home, I investigated my porch, looking for any sign of the delivery man who had dropped off my package I wasn't sure exactly what I was expecting to find, an invoice from the Illuminati. But no, my porch was empty, save for a trash bag full of cans I needed to take to the recycling plant. I checked my PayPal account, but the purchase hadn't posted. I tried to look for the site I'd purchased the contacts on, but I couldn't even find the smallest trace online. I went to bed with an uneasy feeling. Over the course of the next two weeks, I continued my routine. Each morning, I would stare at my contacts, looking for any abnormalities before sticking them in my eyes. The residents on death block slowly grew increasingly translucent while the nurses stayed opaque. I realized after the next death, Mrs. Hamilton, what I suspected from Mr. Brown was true. The contact showed me when someone was going to die. The more transparent a person becomes, the closer they are to death. Mrs. Hamilton was completely invisible the day she died, just as Mr. Brown had been. I scoured the internet, even dropping a question on the likes of Quora on if anyone knew about contacts that let you see when someone was going to die, but to no avail. I don't know why I received these, and honestly, I wish I would have just gone to the eye doctor now. After another week, watching the residents fade away, I finally told Anne about my contacts. She was hardly there anymore. Each day since Mrs. Hamilton, I'd paid close attention to her health. I'm sure I violated a bunch of HIPAA regulations by going through the nurse's clipboard, but I was getting anxious. As far as I could tell, Anne was stable. Her condition was the same as when she was brought in, and she wasn't complaining of any discomfort. Are you playing a prank? She asked hesitantly. I shook my head. No. Then immediately asked, Do you believe me? She looked away, her eyebrows nearly touching as she furred them. I'm a person of science, but you have no reason to lie. She caught me, looking at her strange. Am I invisible? I lied, as solid as ever. I scooted a little closer and took a limp hand into my own. Again, I was surprised I could even touch her. She made that face, and I'm pretty sure that she knew. Instead of saying anything about it, she instead said, Make me a promise. Not a question. Of course, I said, gripping her hand. I'd heard that tone before. Just don't make it sound like a last request. Next month, the meteor shower. Come to Shady Oaks. Watch it with me. And I could feel tears stinging at my eyes. When was the last time I'd cried? Of course, I promise. The next day, I went into Anne's room, pulling a cigarette out of my pocket to share as we did each morning. She wasn't there. Grief hit me. It hit me harder than the day my mom passed, harder than the moment I was sentenced and realized my youth was gone, harder than anything else I've felt in my life. 
I stumbled backwards, the cigarette box softly landing on the tile floor. Then I heard a voice call my name. Did you trip? And I felt tears rolling down my face. Anne, I shouted. You're here? I practically leapt to the bed in one step. Other than some wrinkles on the sheets, there was hardly any indication that Anne could be there. Of course. I reached forward and felt that, yes, she was there. Hey, she scolded. Don't mess up my hair. If it falls in my face, how am I supposed to move it? Sorry, I said, still keeping my hand where about the top of her head was. I just... I thought that... It's okay, she whispered. And I sat down, lighting up a cigarette as usual. After we'd finished our smoke, I went and grabbed a nurse. I made up some story to him, said that Anne was complaining of a headache, and he sat in the chair beside the bed, taking her vitals and talking to her about a headache she, thankfully, pretended to have. I left the room, trying to convince myself everything would be alright. But of course, this was useless. I could feel the dread creeping up on me like a spider to a trapped bug. A little before my lunch break, I heard a commotion. Nurses rushed down the hallway. I followed them, a heavy feeling setting into my stomach. They went straight to Anne's room. When I got to the door, I paused, feeling sick to my stomach. There was Anne. She was staring up at the sky with the same smile she wore when I'd shift the bed to look up at the stars. Nurses gathered around her, busting themselves with saving her. But I knew what would happen next. I couldn't get into a room, the door frame too crowded. But when I looked, I saw her. Those blue eyes staring up at the sky, and there was a smile on her face, as if she could see through the white ceiling and finally gaze at the infinite above. I spent the rest of the day in a daze. Pulmonary embolism. That's what the lead nurse said. She'd had a blood clot in her leg and it had travelled up to her heart. Part of me wanted to get mad, to yell at her, anyone really, but I didn't. I just nodded and let this emptiness spread over me. Anne didn't have a funeral. Her father had showed up once, several days after she passed, and rifled through her jaws, looking for anything of value, but Anne didn't have much. As she was leaving, I was smoking outside. I watched as the first stars of the evening appeared. This was two weeks ago. I don't know why I called out to him. I couldn't even be sure he was Anne's father. Where'd you put her? Is all I asked. He wheeled around, an upset look on his face. Are you talking to me? I put my cigarette out, taking a step towards the man. Where'd you put Anne? I'd like to visit a grave. He just dogged in response, about to sidestep me but moved to stay in front of him. Grave, he scoffed. Do you think she left enough to afford that? You want her so bad? Come on. I followed the man to his car. I realized I didn't even know his name. Surely I had mentioned it at some point, but I'd forgotten. Now didn't seem like a good time to ask. After rooting around the back seat, the man produced a small silver urn. He shoved it into my chest roughly. It took me a moment to realize. He just handed me Anne's ashes. Frankly, he snarled, I don't give a damn what you do with her. I was just going to dump them into the river. I clutched the cool metal of the urn to my chest, watching as he backed out. That night, I set Anne beside the table on the couch. I don't usually watch the news, but Anne always had me turn on the TV as I left. Diligently keeping up with the world, she could hardly participate in. At least I saved you from the ocean, I whispered. Figures the girl who loved the stars would be terrified of sea monsters lurking in the depths. One of the top stories on a local channel was about the coming meteor shower. Fast approaching, there was going to be a viewing party in the town square with vendors and drinks. I looked at the urn, remembering my promise to Anne. We'll still watch them together, I assured. 
I always clicked the TV off as I went to bed, but then I looked at the urn. I knew that Anne was gone, but I'd always left the room dark with the exception of the low glow of a box TV. It didn't feel right to turn it off now. That night, I slept uneasily. I kept waking up to find my body shaking, sobs wrenching their way out of my throat and my face wet from tears and sweat. The thought that I could have prevented this was prevalent. I kept denying what I saw. If I would have told someone, maybe they would have caught the blood clot before it came free from a leg. Maybe Anne would still be here. This kept me awake until my alarm clock went off. Out of habit, I hit snooze, but I got up. I went to the bathroom, and the person looking back at me from the mirror was a sad sight. He was all puffy eyes and chin stubble. I've been wearing the same pair of contacts for about a month and a half. The brand I buy are monthlies, but I usually stretch them out to last two months. They weren't ripped. There was nothing wrong with the contacts, no reason why I shouldn't wear them. But I dumped them. When I opened the contact box to get a new pair, I noticed a scrap of paper at the bottom. I wasn't sure if it had been there before or not. I took the paper out and it had a date on it. Nothing more. The date was marked less than two weeks away. Today's date. I folded the paper, placing it in the pocket of my scrubs and tore open the new contacts. At work, I clocked in gathered my cleaning supplies and cart, and then I went to Anne's room. I was moving on autopilot, thumbing the cigarette box in my pocket, but then I opened the door to an empty room. Oh, was all I could say. Still, I went in and sat on a bed. Instead of perching on the edge, I lay down. It was uncomfortable. The mattress was a little too hard, even by my standards, but the pillow was nice. It smelled like cigarettes and the vanilla shampoo unused. I lit a cigarette, staring at the popcorn ceiling above. Anne had laid like this for over five years. Sure, sometimes they'd roll her outside if she'd requested, and there was a TV she could see if propped up. But the ceiling... I wondered how many hours she'd spent staring up at it. I don't know when I fell asleep but I woke up to the chair of my cigarette dropping onto my collarbone. I immediately shot up and shouted out a couple profanities, patting out the burning ash. This attracted the attention of a nurse, the same one I'd asked to watch Anne days prior. When he walked in, I thought I might yell at him, blame him for what happened, but I couldn't. It was my fault. Also, the guy was translucent. He looked about the same as Anne did when I first put the contacts in. At this point, I had to be honest with myself about the strange ability the contacts possessed. They let me see when a person was going to die. I don't know how, but they do. This man that stood before me, I knew he couldn't have more than a month left if he was lucky. You were close to her, he asked, and I could see that look in his eyes. It was the same one I saw in my reflection. He felt guilty. Yeah, I said, taking the ashtray from the drawer in Anne's nightstand. I snuffed out my cigarette. You know, she could tell you where all the constellations were, even if she hadn't been outside in a year, even if it was daytime. She just knew. He faltered in the doorway, looking backwards. But then he came inside, shutting the door behind him. He sat on the edge of the bed, and rested his elbow on his lap, and tangled his hands into his hair. Suddenly, it struck me how young this kid looked. He was broad-shouldered, but his face was unlined and youthful. He must have just gotten out of college. For a moment, I thought he was going to cry. How? he asked, voice cracking. How did you know? I stayed quiet. She wouldn't have had a headache from the clot, and when you left... He trailed off. When you left, she said her head didn't really hurt, that you were just worried. I got up to leave and then... There was nothing you could have done, I told him, patting him on the shoulder. And I knew it was true, in the same way Anne knew the consolations. There was nothing you could have done. 
He looked up at me, and through his wide eyes, I could see the bed and the tile beneath him. Look, I said, don't blame yourself for what happened. I think you need to take some time off. Go be with your family. You never know how much time you have left. Maybe I should have said more, but those words felt right as they left my throat. The nurse didn't smile, but the corners of his lips twitched. Anyway, I've got to get to work before someone notices how long my break has gone on. I switched the TV on, out of habit, and said, The morning news should be on in a few minutes. Then I went about my day. As I did so, I started to wonder about my new contacts. The reason being that every single soul I encountered was translucent. Every person, regardless of if they were a resident or staff, was as see-through as the nurse I'd talked with earlier. I looked at my own hand. I still appeared solid. Over the course of the week, everyone slowly faded until today. Today, when I went to work, I didn't see a single person. Everyone was there. I heard them. Some especially loud nurses chatting excitedly about the meteor shower happening tonight. But none of them were visible. I did my job as well as I normally do, stopping by Anne's room at the end of my shift to smoke a cigarette. When I got off, I went to the grocery store. There were aisles and aisles full of noise, but completely empty. Carts seemed to stroll themselves, and bags of chips and cookies floated. The baskets and carts were filled with items like beer, hot dogs, frozen pizzas, and sandwich meat. As I walked through, I overheard people buzzing with excitement about the meteor shower. Children were excited to break their curfew, adults were hoping they'd be able to stay awake long enough to see it after a hard day of work. I listened in, feeling as if I was hearing a conversation between ghosts. When I got to the bread aisle, I noticed an old woman. She was the first person I'd actually seen the entire day. Without thinking, I approached her. What are you doing here? I demanded. She looked up at me with fear candidly shining behind her coke bottle glasses. I realized that, as a large man who reeks of cigarettes and cleaning chemicals, it's not exactly socially acceptable for me to suddenly stump over to an elderly woman and demand things of her. Sorry, I said. I just thought, um, you look much like my grandma. I had a long day and, well, sorry. The tension in her shoulders relaxed a little. You were reaching for this, weren't you? I asked as I grabbed one of the loaves from the top shelf for her. She inspected the Best Buy date carefully and then smiled up at me. Thank you. She added the loaf to a basket. The top shelves always has the freshest food. It's no problem, I smiled. She was about to turn away, but I needed to know why I could see her, but no one else. So do you... Are you getting ready for the meteor shower party tonight too? She eyed me suspiciously. All I had in my basket was a six pack of cheap beer and some pizza rolls. I don't know what those items say about me, but for a single man in his late mid-thirties, I assume it doesn't say upstanding citizen. Still, she smiled. No, I have to catch a flight in... She looked at her watch. An hour and a half. I'm just doing some shopping for my husband. She jerked her head towards the benches at the front of the store. I saw a cane standing upright. No person was there, nor the clothes of a person but there was a cane. I nodded in that direction, pretending I could see someone. He can't get around as good as he used to, so I wanted to make sure he was okay. It's my sister's 60th, and we're all going to Venice. I nodded in understanding. That old fool. Her eyes sparkled with affection. He tried to go out and end up stuck. I'm just making sure he's set up for the week. I helped her carry her things out to the car. Again, I wondered if there was something more I should say. I wondered if I should tell her about her husband appearing to be invisible. I thought about suggesting that he go with her. But it felt wrong. I drove home, passing cars that had no drivers nor passengers. Now, I'm at my computer. I don't really know who's going to hear this, but I felt compelled to get this out there. 
Something is going to happen today. When I turned on the local news, they were talking about tonight's meter shower. They had shots of vendors setting up booths and people donning shirts with sparkling stars. Interestingly, the contacts don't work over camera. I discovered that, even through the lens of my camera, I could see people as they were. Solid. The news cut to the meteorologist, who commented on the meteor story. Folks, isn't it amazing how our atmosphere protects us? If it wasn't there, the space debris that's going to create this beautiful light show for us tonight would instead be terrifying. Now, onto the weather. And suddenly, it clicked. The little old lady from the grocery store was proof that at least some would survive. But the reason why everyone was invisible wasn't because these new contacts were different from the last pair. They were still showing me when people were going to die. It was just that everyone was about to go. Well, everyone in town at least. I wondered if there was anything I could do. If there was any warning I could send that would save them. And, well... Even if there was a way I could evacuate my whole city, maybe my entire state, even if people listened to me, the thought of trying to do so left a sour taste in my mouth. It felt like going against fate. It's nearly midnight. The meteor shower will start in just a few hours. I could get in my car, pick a destination and speed away. I might even get away from whatever is coming next. But... I made a promise to Anne. After I post this, I'm going to take my six pack, place Anne's urn in the passenger seat of my car, and then drive to Shady Oaks. I'll sit in the trunk of my car with Anne beside me, and we'll share a cigarette, just like we always do. I'll look up at the sky, waiting for the meteor shower to start. For as long as I can remember, I've had a fascination with nature and the unexplored wilderness. I remember meandering through the woods outside my house when I was a kid, collecting plants and fungi for personal collections. I would sometimes wander through shallow ponds, catching frogs, toads and newts, armed with a small net, the same net being used for catching insects as well. As time would pass, I'd eventually move on to greater wilderness, geared with hiking camping and photography equipment for the wildlife I sought to capture shots of. Today, I'm a biologist and environmentalist, with my wildlife expertise being mainly in mammals, specifically bears and large carnivores. The job I remember having the most was with the Canadian Wildlife Service, or CWS for short, where I was tasked with tracking and observing grizzly bears in order to assess the challenges and threats they face. You see, permanent removal of suitable habitat by human activity within grizzly distribution remains one of the principal threats to the bears. And because individual grizzlies need large home ranges, large-scale industrial projects, increased future resource development, and establishment of transportation corridors could potentially pose a significant threat by the removal of a larger portion of effective habitat, in turn significantly limiting their range. Climate change also posed the threat, with mountain pine beetle populations propagating as a result, and destroying forests of white bark pine, these trees being an essential food source for grizzlies. One day, the service put in charge of a localized project for grizzlies in a heavily remote part of the Albertan part of the Rocky Mountains. The Rockies of Alberta are known for being a vast, largely inaccessible stretch of wilderness, with many parts only reachable by air. This has made it a refuge for the plethora of wildlife, many of whose population trends in the area are still as of now unknown. The expedition would last about two weeks and would consist of tracking individual bears as well as measuring anthropogenic effects and, to a lesser extent, the effects of climate change on the area. Without further delay, I prepared my gear and left to help with the project. I had flown over from operations in Calgary to the location of the base via helicopter, where from then on out, we would continue throughout the mountains on foot, setting up camp at different locations. 
we were expected to return to the base at the end of the expedition, where we would be airlifted back to civilization. Upon arrival at the base, the site was just a small opening on a mountainside, surrounded by nothing but what seemed like endless coniferous forest. Nestled here was a small log cabin where my colleague Sean, a veterinarian who had arrived here about a few days earlier, had set up operations. After the helicopter left, I went on over to the base cabin to check in. When I entered, Sean was there, testing out the radio tech used to track bears. He seemed very focused on the task at hand. It took him a few seconds to notice my presence. Oh, you're here. Perfect timing too. He seemed rather ecstatic upon seeing me. Yeah, quite the hassle getting here, I had replied. Curious about the tracking equipment, I asked. You collared one already? Sure did. Darted and fitted a large saw about two days ago. I'm not entirely sure, but she might be pregnant. Hearing this, it did make sense, as around this time of year, female grizzlies would be gestating after mating in the late spring or early summer, preparing to hibernate for the coming winter. You have to take me to her. I should be able to confirm a pregnancy. Well, now that you're here, we can get moving. Immediately, we readied our gear and set out with an antenna and receiver to find the sow. We hiked for several hours, following the direction the antenna led us in, as well as signs in the area which would indicate a bear passing through. Despite our efforts, however, we found little to nothing, not even a sound from the receiver. As it started to get dark, we settled down in a small clearing to set up camp for the night. It seemed quite odd that despite a bear being tracked, there was little evidence, if at all, of any bear in the area. Something about this was all bizarrely off. The next morning, we awoke to the sound of the receiver producing a tone. As soon as we heard this, it had to mean the bear we were looking for was nearby. We rushed to pack up and head out in the direction of the signal, and as we headed out, the tone from the receiver became louder. I knew the sooner our bear was in sight, we had to proceed with the utmost caution. After being darted, the bear could become incredibly agitated and charge, so I would have to take the shot from a safe distance. However, as we treaded through, we reached what seemed like a cave opening at the foot of the mountain. It was here I knew that any further advent was far too risky, as entering a den with a bear inside was straight up reckless. Sean turned to look at me and asked, Now what? I don't think she's coming out. Considering that this time of year, bears would be preparing for hibernation, that was most certainly a possibility. We will set camp out away from here. Might have to abort if she doesn't leave by tomorrow. Reluctantly, we set off about half a mile north of the den and set up camp for the night. Come the following day, we woke up, packed up camp, and headed back to the den site. However, when we got there, something was wrong. The receiver wasn't creating the tone anymore, not even faintly. While this might have meant that the bear had left the den, there were no tracks shown to be leaving the den. Everything was as we had left it. Another possibility was that there was a malfunction with the radio collar, and that due to an unknown cause, it had stopped transmitting signals to the receiver. We gotta go in. I was set into a state of surprise and fear from hearing Sean suggest this. I told him, Are you insane? We could get ripped to shreds entering that den. Well, I don't see any other way we're gonna recover that collar. As life-threatening as this idea was, I came to the realization that no other option was available. Okay, fine. I hesitantly agreed. But the moment I hear anything, we get out of there immediately. We entered as slowly and as cautiously as we could, neither of us making so much as a whisper. Inside, however, the den was not just the den, but seemed to be a small network of caverns. This made me even more fearful, knowing the bear could charge and maul one of us at any moment, if still inside. As we proceeded, I noticed a metallic glint. 
I walked over to it to see that it was the radio collar off the bear's neck. How this happened, I honestly had no idea, with my best guess being some weird error with the collar itself. I picked it up, and when I turned around, Sean was nowhere to be seen. I wanted to call out for him, but didn't want to make any loud noise in case the bear was still inside the cavern with us. Frightened as I was, I cautiously proceeded to look for him, my heart beginning to pound. As I traversed through, I saw a faint light, the exit to the den. I rushed toward it, hoping to find Sean outside. When I exited the cave, the surroundings around me were... different. Back when we arrived, it was a heavily forested area. But what I was looking at now was more of an open mixture of forest and parkland. What the hell happened? Some of the gear we had left outside was missing as well. There wasn't even a trace of it. Oddest of all. It was night. The only explanation I could think of at the moment was that the caverns we had entered led to various openings and that I had simply gotten lost and ended up at a different exit from where we had entered at first. But there was no possible way we were in the caverns for that long. Despite trying to rationalise this, I decided that locating Sean was a more important priority. I headed back in what I believe was the direction of camp, believing he had somehow returned there, with the brightness of the night sky being the only thing allowing me to navigate my way through. Before, we had quite a bit of trouble moving through the dense woods, carrying our equipment and all, but now the trees seemed much sparser, almost as if I was in a tundra of the Yukon. I just ploughed on through, trying to make sense of what was happening, yet to no avail did I find any sign of our last campsite. None of this made sense. The surroundings, the time of day, I had no idea what the hell was going on. As I was trying desperately to make sense of my situation, in the distance I caught a glimpse of several ominous figures moving around. I wasn't able to make out what they were at first, but when I approached to get a better look, I recognised it as a small herd of caribou. My first thoughts was that this was good news, seeing as woodland caribou are a threatened species, and the fact that this area is home to a healthy, previously unknown population could aid in the species' conservation efforts. Yet at the same time, something seemed a bit off about them. Woodland caribou are characterised by a darker tone of fur, as well as thicker and somewhat pronounced antlers. These, however, sported a silvery coat, as well as a more curved antler shape, reminiscent of the barren ground subspecies found farther north. Could these have been some sort of weird morph, or perhaps a hybrid subspecies? I ultimately decided to move on and continue searching for Sean, in spite of things continuing to make no sense. I continued wandering through the brush aimlessly, Still no success of finding any sign of Sean anywhere, and at this point, I was tired. As soon as I got to the nearest outcropping, I sat down to catch my breath for a brief minute. I took this time to look up at the night sky. The view was, admittedly, beautiful. While it's easy to view the stars better in places far from civilization, as I've had the privilege of from time to time before, Here, it was unlike anything I've seen before. I'd never seen the sky at this time in such vivid detail. I simply sat for a good ten minutes, mesmerised by the sight of it all. My attention was shifted upon hearing a faint, slow rumble. The best I could describe it was a soft drumming noise that I could just barely hear. But I could somehow feel it, as if it was sending some sort of vibrations through the ground. Curiosity once more took hold of me, and I headed out towards the source of the noise. Was some sort of animal creating these sounds? The largest animals in the region are wood bison, which do make deep grunts and low rumblings, although this sounded much more... rhythmic. Wanting to find out, I continued in the direction the noise was emanating from. It started to increase in volume as I got closer to the point where it started to sound more familiar, like I've heard this exact sound somewhere before. 
I finally reached the source of the noise at a lakeside, and what I saw, I still have no rational explanation of what, or more so, how I saw what I had seen. At the shore, there were several large animals, elephantine in appearance, long hair and curved tusks. There was no mistake, I was laying eyes on a herd of living, breathing, woolly mammoths. How though? How was an animal supposedly extinct for 10,000 years right here in front of me? None of this could possibly be real. I had to be imagining or hallucinating, but there was no possible way that any of this was a real scenario. I took a good five minutes to get myself together before coming to terms with the fact that all of this was most certainly real, and right before my eyes. I knew the sounds were familiar, as I'd heard similar bellowing before many times from captive elephants. While I still had to take care of the situation I was in, I couldn't help but take some time to just look. I decided to sit and watch the mammoths go about their business. The structure of the herd seemed identical to modern elephants, the adults being all female, with two calves present, likely not even a year old. They appeared to be feeding on low brows, lichens and shrubs probably why they've come to the lakeside. The ground beneath them was littered with fecal matter, the smell being quite strong even from where I was sitting. While I didn't want to get too close, I wanted to get a better look, so slowly I walked down to the shoreline. Once I was closer, my view was much better. I noticed one of the calves running around in the shallow water, splashing and rolling as well. I had no doubt that this was play behaviour, reminiscent of African and Asian elephant calves. Soon after, it trotted ashore, shaking itself like a dog. My attention then turned to one of the herd's adult females, who apparently was looking right at me. To ensure my safety, I stood my ground, as it watched me for a good, solid minute. Soon after, it turned back towards the herd, losing interest in me. It was in this moment, right here, that my childhood sense of wonder was overtaking me. I was right here, laying eyes on animals nobody has had the chance to see for several millennia, not even questioning how, simply relishing the fact that it was happening. Then, right out of nowhere, a distant, a deep, echoing howl broke out. The sound caught the attention of the herd, who, with haste, immediately started to depart the area, bolting out into the brush without looking back. As somebody who's worked with large carnivores, I've heard the howls of wolves many times before, and have tracked several packs in my day. However, that sound was like no wolf I've ever heard. Whatever it could have been was apparently dangerous enough to scare the mammoths away. I decided not to stick around and proceeded to return to my search for Sean. I headed out into the brush once more looking for any signs. I was still very hesitant to call out, not wanting to draw the attention of whatever creature made those howls. Then something off caught my attention, within a small grove of trees. As I headed over to inspect it, my eyes lit up in shock. It was the gear and supplies that Sean was carrying around with him, but all torn up, as if something had grabbed it and ripped it to shreds. The antenna I used to pick up the radio signals from before was there, and was totaled. On the ground next to the wreckage were large footprints, seemingly canine in appearance, but larger than any wolf track I've ever seen. That's when I heard it again. This time, the sound was much closer, and was accompanied by faint snarls, hinting at more than one animal. My heart started pounding as I bolted back into the woods in the direction of the cave, not sure if Sean was even alive or not, but just concerned with getting out of here alive. As I was running, the foliage around me started to rustle. I froze up in fear, hoping whatever it was would run the other way. Then something jumped out. It was Sean, all covered in bloody scars with his clothes torn up. What the hell? What happened to you? Run, just run, now. Not far behind him, I could hear faint howls and snarling. The two of us bolted out of there, not looking back, just headed for the caves as fast as we could. 
we finally got to the entrance of the caves. But then, that's when we saw them. Two large, dog-like animals jumped in front of us, gnashing at us with a deep, roar-like bark. This stopped us dead in our tracks, both of us frozen in utter terror. These things resembled some unholy conjoining of a wolf and a hyena. I've worked with plenty of large predators in my day, but these... I didn't know what the hell these were. The larger individuals had its sights locked on us, and with each second inched towards us closer, readying itself to pounce. As it slowly backed us away, two more appeared from behind us, bearing their teeth at us to drive us towards the jaws of the other two, cutting off any route of escape. Now there was no exit, as all four of them closed in on us, preparing for the kill. Then, Sean looked at me. You've got to get out of here while you still can. Without saying anything else, he made a break for it. No way, don't! My words did nothing to stop him, and without hesitation, the creatures darted after him. Within seconds, all four were on top of him, violently ripping him to pieces. All I could hear was his muffled screams against the frenzied snarls and hisses. I knew at this point there was nothing I could do. I made a run for the cave. When I entered, I desperately scurried to the caverns. It didn't matter if there was any bear in there or not. I just wanted to leave. I could barely see a thing in the darkness, but none of that mattered. I just kept rushing on through. Finally, I saw a faint light, and without hesitation, I ran to it. When I got out, I was back where me and Sean entered in through. The gear we had left outside was still there, and it was daytime. It was just day, as if absolutely nothing changed. What the hell had just happened? I was still shaken up by what I had just witnessed. The image of Sean getting torn up by those things was still fresh in my mind. Without any delay, I ran back through the woods to the base as fast as I could. It took me at least three hours before I finally got back to base. When I did, I proceeded to go and radio CWS. I had reported a state of emergency, as my colleague Sean was missing, and that I was unable to locate him. I felt that if I tried to explain everything I had witnessed, they'd think I was delusional. The next day, a helicopter was sent to pick me up and return me to Calgary. Albertan authorities were unable to recover Sean's body, and his death was listed as a potential bear mauling. Soon after, I stepped down from my position at CWS. To this day, I can still hear the echoes of Sean's scream as whatever the hell those things were tore him to shreds. I still have not been able to make out or rationally explain what all of that was. That place I'd come across, how was it there? How was any of that even possible? My whole life, I dreamed of discovering something that has not been found. But after all I had been through, it made me come to realize, perhaps some things are better left alone. Down at the very bottom of my garden, where the grass and rundown fence meets the field and forest beyond, is an old stone well. I'm looking at it now from my bedroom window, as the deep grey clouds slowly roll their way across the sky. The first pinpricks of rain tap coldly against the glass. The well came with a house. We didn't build it or anything. It borders an old trail path, one that runs between our garden and the field. Hikers come by sometimes. They stop for a moment at the well, they toss in a coin, and then away they go, on with their lives. But I watch. I watch through the window, waiting for something to happen. Because, for as long as I can remember, I have always believed that a man has lived in the well. I'm not sure where this suspicion first came from. A dream, perhaps. When I was younger, I used to play near there. My parents never let me climb on or around the well itself, but I'd sit nearby. 
I climbed trees and tried to peer down into the tunnel. I'm tall enough now to just stand right beside it, of course. I'm too old to play. But I still go down to the well sometimes. Run my hand over the cold, wet stone. I throw in a coin or two. Make a wish. And when I do, it's almost like I can hear something. Like a whispering in the back of my head. Like someone trying to talk to me. It's fascinating, in a creepy kind of way. Maybe I'll go down there again now, before it gets too dark. I draw on my coat, push my arms through the sleeves, and I head from my room and down the stairs to the back door, slipping on my boots and make my way out and into the rain. I drop my hood as I walk the length of the garden and across the grass. The grim, dark stone of the well draws closer and closer, beckoning me. Beyond it, the trees rustle softly in the breeze. Rainwater drips from the pine. I come to a stop at the well's edge, and I look over, down into the darkness below. Down it goes, deep, dark. Might as well be bottomless, for all I know. The coins never make a splash. I never hear them hit the earth or stone at the base. They just vanish into the void. I shiver. It's cold this evening. I reach into my pocket for a coin, taking one out and turning it between my fingers. Shining silver. Yes, this'll do nicely. I make my wish. My go-to is this. I wish to learn more about the secrets of the well, and I flick the coin from my thumb, watching it as it tumbles through the air and disappears down into the shadows, bouncing and tinkling off the stony walls. And then... Silence. The coin falls and is lost to the void, to the gloomy, unending darkness below. I place my palms on the rough stone and look down, waiting. The rain patters on the grass all around me. I strain my ears. Come on, I mutter. Give me something. I wait a little longer. It's always right as I'm about to leave, to give up, to conclude that I've always imagined it and that nothing is going to happen. I slide my hand away from the stone. I make to turn back to the house. And it's then that I hear his voice. The voice of the man in the well. An almost imperceptible whisper, right there in the back of my mind. Almost. I hesitate. I return my attention to the well. Almost, I repeat, murmuring. What does that mean? There is a wet croak of a sound, and then... I cannot yet claim the key. My heart hammers. It's unusual to hear so much in one go. My throat dries as I lean a little closer, peering down, squinting into the darkness. What do you mean? I whisper. What key? But there, the voice ceases. I reach into my pocket for my phone. I switch on the flash and angle the light down into the well. But it does little. It gives me a couple further meters of sight but then it is swallowed by the gloom and lost to the dark. Hello? I call down softly, then a little louder. Hello? But there is no response. The rain falls harder, and it leaks through the pine beyond the broken old fence. I sigh and turn to leave, trudging back across the grass to the house. I consider throwing in another coin, but no. I'll leave it for now. A part of me still thinks I'm making it all up, and if that's the case, well, I certainly don't want to encourage any madness. I prepare for my night as the rain clatters on the glass, casting one last look out into the grey beyond, down to the well at the bottom of the garden. I swear, I can see something in the moonlight, you know, glistening and glinting on the edge of the well. It's tough to see in the dark, but it looks like a pair of coins. Q.
curious. I didn't see a hiker go by, and it would be unusual at such a time, and in such weather, but not impossible, I guess. I quietly draw the curtains, and the rain falls steadily through the night. The next day goes as they typically do. The weather is grim, the sky is overcast, a couple of hikers pass by. I watch from my window as they throw in their coins. I watch intently, waiting for something to happen, to hear more of those maddening, taunting words in my head. But no, there is nothing. It has to be me. I have to be the only one to make the wish. So I return that evening once my work is done. The grass is still wet, though it isn't raining tonight. I stand by the edge of the well and toss in a coin, a copper today, and make that same wish. I wish to learn more about the secrets of the well. And I wait, waiting for a response. The trees rustle nearby, the sky rolls through its tones of grey, and before me stands the well, ancient, moss-covered stone. The walls, perhaps the only thing preventing the darkness inside from spilling out and over the land like ink. Come on, I know you have more to say, I whisper into the well, peering down. My most faithful visitor, I will be sure to reward you when I have the key, friend. This does not come through as a murmur in the back of my head, it comes through clear, cold and clear. Words that send my pulse into overdrive, and I scramble away from the gaping mouth of the well, slipping in the grass and tumbling down into the mud with a gasp. Hello? I reply in fear, scrambling to my feet and looking down into the dark. Is... is someone there? Hello? My rational mind battles with the irrational. A voice can only mean that someone is trapped down there in the well. But no... That doesn't really make much sense either. Do you need help? I call, though my voice cracks and breaks on this word. Yes, comes the reply, slow and measured. Just another few wishes. That's all I need. Be careful when you make them though. I might just be able to grant them. I turn on the spot and I head the hell back to the house, noping away as my heart pounds in my chest. I just repeat the same word over and over in my head. No, 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 it's not real. I let my imagination get carried away. I have willed my thoughts into something beyond their means. I lock the door and return to my room. I draw the curtains, resenting that I have the house alone for the night, and I crawl into bed, staring into the darkness as the voice rattles around my head. The voice of the man in the well. No, not possible. The man in the well does not actually exist. He can't. I fall eventually into a restless sleep. My dreams are like water. I stand in the shimmering grey of a misty field, the well at its centre. There are trees around us, I think, but they are hard to see through the fog. And every time I turn to try and look at one, its location changes. The well starts to leak. Water spills up and over the stone and flows through the grass. Roots push and creep their way from the earth, long and cream white, like bone, slithering through the grass round my feet. And as I watch in terror, a shadow rises up from the dark of the well, the darkness itself perhaps, choosing for itself a form as a grin appears in its swirling depths. It's time to make a wish, says the voice, loud and sharp. I awake in cold panic, staring up and into the dark. I haul off the sheets and head to the window, pulling back the curtains. And there, through the rain, is the well. No shadows, no creeping roots, but there are those coins again, shining silver specks on the edge of the stone. The rain falls, and angrily now, I pull on my coat. I head downstairs, the steps creaking beneath my feet. 
I pull on my boots, unlock the back door, and march through the haze towards the well. It's just a well, I say out loud. Nothing more. I'm not going to be afraid of a cluster of stones, and I'm not losing my mind over this. I stand at the well's edge, not failing to note that the two little sparkling coins have now vanished. I run my hands over the rocks. I crouch down by the well's base to look for them, pushing my hands through the grass. But they are nowhere to be seen. I stand back up and press my palms into the edge of the well, shouting down into the void. Show yourself! Cold washes of fear pass through me in waves, but I persist, stubborn. Show yourself. Let me help you find the key, or whatever it is that you want. Aren't you going to grant my wishes? I'm just shouting nonsense, really. I know that nothing is going to respond. Surely. Surely not. I pause and wait for a response. My breathing slows. My heart rate eases. No, just as I expected, the well is empty. I reach into my pocket for a coin and toss it down the well. I wish to meet the man in the well, I mutter as it clinks and bounces off the stone on its way down. And then, in the darkness of the night, something starts to change. For a second, I swear that I'm imagining it. But no, the ground, the very grass and earth beneath my feet is being slowly drawn to the well. What the? I don't understand. This isn't physically possible. I take a step, then another. I stand right by the well and stay still, but I can feel my feet moving nonetheless. I look down into the darkness of the well's tunnel, seeing nothing but void. I reach into my pocket for my phone, hands shaking a little now, my breath clouding in the cold. And after a few attempts, I switch on the flash. I hold the phone over the edge, angling the light down into the darkness. And the wide-eyed face of the man in the well grins back up at me. I scream in fright and slip, staggering back and collapsing against the rotted old fence. My phone tumbles and bounces off the stone, cracking the screen in the corner before it falls into the wet grass beside me. I feel a rumbling now, subtle, in my bones and across my skin. A presence, I suppose, as the man in the well reaches a slow, shadowed hand out and over the edge of the well. His fingers are long, far longer than they have any right to be. His second hand appears beside it, slow, creeping movements. And up he rises, up and up and out of the well, growing taller and taller and taller. He's dressed in black, his skin too pitch black, but his eyes, his eyes sparkle like silver, white and wide, and his grin, his teeth do not match, each one looks like it could have come from a different mouth. He reaches full height, staring down at me, and yet he still ascends. With slow, terrible, deliberate purpose, he simply rises, his legs stretch upwards, up and up, until he is twice my height, and then three times as tall. At last he stops, and we regard each other in silence, he grinning, and myself, frozen and white with fear. The rain patters around him, a worm rises up from the grass just by my hand, slithering and squirming from the earth. I open my mouth to speak, staring in horror at this monster from the well. Don't hurt me, I whisper, and the grin of the man in the well stretches wider. Almost free, he mutters, his lips cracking and stretching with the words. Just a little more. Then I can come help you. I can come grant you all of your wishes. A little more of what? I croak out, backed up fully against the fence. What happened to you? Who are you? They sealed me away. He whispers as the wind blows. They told me I would remain in the dark until I could pay my debt. His eyes flicker from me to the worm and then back. 
when I can buy the key, unshackle myself, and be free. I stare at him, and he at I. I don't understand, I whisper. They sealed me away, he repeats, but my debt is almost paid. I am almost free, and I can grant you all your wishes, my greatest patron. I owe you your wishes. Patron? I reply, my throat death dry. The man in the well grins wide, and in a slow, sickening gesture, he reaches into his pocket. I follow the motion with my eyes as he carefully draws from it a coin. But no, not just any coin, it's the one I threw in mere minutes ago. He cocks his head, the little dark pinpricks in the center of his eyes widening and shrinking. The debt is almost paid, and I will be free to leave this well, friend. After so, so long, and I will come for you. He begins to lean down towards me. His legs in the well remain perfectly straight, but forwards he leans, his face drawing closer to me, closer and closer and I can take it no more. I clamber to my feet as a river of horrors runs down my spine. I lurch away and I scramble across the length of the garden. I shoot a look back over my shoulder to see him watching, to see him grinning. I slam the door to the house and barricade it shut. I race up the stairs to my room and stare through the window, and I watch as the man in the well slowly starts to sink. As he descends, lower and lower. His hands at the sides disappear beneath the rim of the well, then his torso, his chest and neck, until only the top of his head is showing. One with the darkness and the shadows, his eyes like two shining coins in the gloom. I have not made any more wishes at the well. I have not thrown any more money down but there is only so much I can do. I chase away the hikers that pass by like a lunatic. I stop them from throwing down their coins. But I am heading away for college soon. A blessing and a danger. What will happen if there is no one to guard the well? My debt is almost paid, he had said. Then I will come for you. I work at a pub about 15 miles from my home. I often get off work late, like 1 or sometimes even 2am, and then have to make an exhausted, lonely drive back to the house in the dark. It's been taking me a little longer than usual these past couple of weeks, as works on the main road have forced me to use a long and winding alternative route through the forest, and I hate it. A dark, creepy forest in the middle of the night all alone in my car. I had a nightmare not long ago about the car breaking down between the shadows of the pines, and I'm embarrassed to say that it really knocked my confidence. But whatever, it's not like I have a choice. Almost every night I make this drive back. I leave the main road behind, and I wind my way through the hills, and then the forest. The branches overhang the road, like ancient twisting arms they reach out for me as I pass beneath and between, reaching out for me in the dark. There's this one corner in particular that just sends my heart racing every single damn time. It's steep as hell, and I have to slow the car right down to prevent myself from driving directly into the bushes at the roadside. Around it winds in a quick, brutal curve, and then there's a long, sinister straight, one in which you cannot see exactly where it ends even with the vehicle's lights on full beam. It takes a while, but at the end of this straight is another winding turn, somewhat similar to the first, and it's only then that I can actually start breathing normally again, as it's here that the forest begins to thin out and the hills recede, before the road joins up with a more widely used section of road. At that first steep turning, there's a very small clearing, 
a section of long grass where the bushes don't quite meet. And on one terrible night, as I rounded the corner, the lights of my car were reflected back at me from the glowing eyes of a hare, sat patiently and seemingly waiting for my arrival. I just about jumped out of my skin. I remember this gasp of dismay rising up from my throat as I slammed on the brakes. Not sure of why I did that. Instinctively, I guess. But the hare didn't even move. Didn't even twitch. Once I'd calmed myself and started moving again, the hare just sat and watched, perfectly still. Except for its head, that is. His head turned with the movement of the vehicle, following the car with its eyes, till the creature disappeared from view. What the hell was that? I muttered to myself as the road straightened out. Animals sure are weird at this time of night. I laughed awkwardly, the sound hollow and forced in the isolation of the car. The aircon crackled and I cleared my throat, the engine rumbling softly in the night. I'm driving home now, actually, listening to that same soft rumbling, entering into the forest with my jaw set, frustrated at the repetitive nature of this fear. When are they going to fix that damn main road already? I murmured to myself as I left the lamp-lit road behind me, turning off and passing my way between the hills, the ferns and the trees, rising gradually up and all around. It's a windy one tonight, and the branches sigh in quiet expectation as I pass beneath them, entering deeper into this forest, as a trespasser almost. That's how it feels. I swallow, my throat dry. You can do this. You do this every night. Every night, and tonight is no different. I reach for the radio and turn it on. It takes a second to start working, but when it does, it begins to play a tune I do not recognize. Still, the music is comforting. The radio crackles and fades in and out, but the sound is still miles better than that of the wind whispering through the trees outside. One of the trees has lost the branch, and the thing lies dangerously at the edge of the road. I slow the car down and bring it across the road to pass the branch by, my headlights illuminating the waiting, watchful, endless army of trees, all stood silently in their positions in the darkness, stretching out to infinity. I always mean to check Google Maps upon my return home, to see for how deep the forest actually goes, to see how wide it stretches. But you know how it is. By the time I actually make it back to my house, all I want to do is sleep. So, I just never get around to it. Something moves in the shadows off to the left. My train of thought is derailed. I suck some air in through my teeth, the hairs on my forearms all standing on end as I stare out into the darkness. But there is nothing. Just the constant flow of the rustling grass and the midnight breeze. Get it together for goodness sake. It's just a forest. I'm approaching a sharp bend now. I have a right turn to make and then the steep curve in the cracked pothole ridden road will be right there. I slow down the car in preparation, shifting into a lower gear. And to my sick surprise, I notice that something has been drawn on the road ahead. A picture in white chalk. It is illuminated by the glare in my headlights. An enormous, open eye. Crude, but quite obvious in its intention. It passes beneath the car as I drive over it, and a second chalk eye appears. Like the first, it stretches from one side of the road to the other, but this one has been drawn to be closed. It too passes underneath the car. I feel sweat budding on my skin. It's just some kids. Some dumb kids drew some graffiti on the road during the day, for fun. They were probably on a walk or a hike or something. A part of me considers turning around, driving back to the pub, finding an alternative route home. Maybe going all the way down to the nearest town. But no, that would add an extra hour onto my journey time, at least. And besides, the road is narrow here in the forest, the thought of coming to a stop and attempting a slow, painful, vulnerable turnaround between these trees and the shadows 
The mere thought of it makes me squirm in discomfort. I approach the turn, surrounded by darkness. I slow the car down and bring around the steering wheel. There's a huge, twisted tree here covered in moss. Once I pass this corner, I'll be at a sharp bend. The place with a clearing where I saw that creepy hair. Well, I pass around the tree. And there's the clearing. But there's no hair this time. To my dismay, I find that the clearing is occupied by something else. My heart stops in my chest. My eyes widen in fright and a sharp, icy shard of terror strikes down my spine and turns my stomach. There is a figure stood alone in the clearing, dressed entirely in black, a hood covering their face, hands in black gloves, kept coldly at the sides. Damn, damn. I do not stop the car, but my foot twitches on the accelerator, and the engine revs as I bring the vehicle round the turn. Who the hell is that? What sort of person stands alone in a place like this at 2am? These are not questions I particularly want answers to. As I drive around this sharp section of road, the figure remains perfectly still, motionless. I bring the car around, and as the glow of my lights pass them by, they vanish quickly into the shadows. Jesus, I muttered to myself, heart pounding as I step on the gas. What the hell? The car accelerates down the long straight section of road, passing beneath the boughs of the trees. Though every second that passes, I'm half expecting that hooded figure to suddenly appear in the centre of the road, to be caught in the glare of my headlights and to rush towards the hood of my car. A mad, high-pitched laugh escapes my throat. No, I say out loud. Nope, no, no, no. He was camping, camping with his friends, left the group for a pee and went to that little roadside clearing to look at the stars. It didn't look like he was looking up at the stars. Don't think about it. Just don't think about it. Besides, I'm nearly out now anyway. One more winding turn at the end of this section of straight and then I can breathe. The trees will start thinning and the hills will pull back. And then there's another road. An actual used road. One that's well maintained and well illuminated with street lamps. Just a little further, a little further. The radio crackles, the song jumps. I reach, after what feels like forever, the end of the long straight. I ease off the accelerator as I bring the car around. Damn, looks like more of those disturbing chalk eyes drawn onto the weed-ridden road. I pass first over an eye that has been drawn open and then an eye drawn closed. Who the hell is making these things? What's happening tonight? I don't like it. I don't like any of this. I just want to get home. I pass by a huge, twisted tree, covered in moss. Wait, I've already passed that tree, haven't I? Every single night, I pass that same tree, and I could have sworn I'd already driven right past it tonight. I round the corner, expecting the trees to thin out, and to see the dim, distant lights of the street lamps through the branches. But, to my complete horror, I do not. There is only more forest. Thick, dark forest. And that steep, sharp bend. The same bend as before. There's the clearing. And my blood runs cold as I see that hooded figure, still standing exactly where I left him. The figure at the side of the road. No, 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 no. Not possible. Please, this isn't possible. My breathing becomes increasingly shallow. I do not blink as I pass the figure by, decelerating rapidly to prevent myself from knocking into the roadside bushes. Something is wrong here. Very, very wrong. Am I having a stroke? This already happened. I swear this already happened. Did I loop around on myself? No, that's not possible either. There are no turn-offs on the forest route. No other roads join onto this one. There's no way to circle back without stopping and physically turning the vehicle around. As with before, the figure does not move or react to the lights or sounds of my car in any way. 
they just stand there, stock still, a silent, menacing presence in the shadows, gradually disappearing into the darkness as I pass around the sharp bend, and the long straight of the forest road stretches out before me. But I've already driven this. What the hell is happening? I try not to panic, but I'm struggling. It's just like my nightmare, the one in which I broke down in the middle of the forest. I don't remember how it ended, but it didn't end well. That much, I'm sure of. The engine growls as I drive through the darkness, the sensation of being watched. Watched by a myriad of invisible eyes from the shadows makes my skin crawl with terrible discomfort. Just a little further. The radio crackles. The song jumps. I ease off the accelerator as I bring the car around the turn at the end of the straight. But there it is again. A twisted, moss-covered tree. The eyes of chalk scrawled onto the road. No, please... The car passes over the eye drawn open. It passes over the eye drawn closed. I daren't bring the car to a total stop, but I lower the speed right down to the point that I'm trundling between the trees, terrified of what I'm going to see around this corner. I'm going to see the figure. The figure is going to be standing in the clearing. Damn, what do I do? What the hell do I do? I round the corner, and sure enough, there he is just as I left him, standing stock still, his arms at his side, face obscured in the shadows of that dark hood. I step on the gas, the car lurches into life, and the engine revs loudly as I bring the vehicle around the turn, the tires screeching on the road and knocking into the bushes and branches at the roadside, their wooden claws scraping and scratching at the glass. I curse loudly, and the engine roars as I tear away from the straight, it bumps up and down on the potholes as I try my hardest to leave this terrible loop behind. But I'm unable. Again, it happens. Again and again. Over and over. The long straight of forest. The turn at its far end. The twisted tree. The chalk eyes. And then that steep, sharp bend. The little clearing. And the dark figure stood waiting. My skin is hot with stress and slick with sweat, but my insides are death cold, pumped full of icy adrenaline and surges of sickening fear. I even try turning back. With my heart hammering, I perform a chaotic and jarring turn in the road, facing back the opposite way down the long straight of forest. But at its end, I find nothing but a turn at the far end, the twisted musk of a tree, the chalk eyes and the figure at the roadside. I try and hold back a sob as I bring the speed right down, easing the vehicle round the bend, glancing over to the figure in his stock still position in the shadows of this forest. I pass him by. I begin to round the corner. And I decide to try the brake. I tap it lightly, just enough to slow the speed of the car and the forest and road behind me are illuminated in the red glow of the brake lights. I glance up to the rearview mirror, and in this terrible, deep red glow, I see the figure start to move from his position. His arms remain at his sides, his legs and feet do not move, and yet he drifts from his position on the clearing and into the center of the road. He turns his legs remaining perfectly still, and he begins to move towards me. Through the red glow, and towards the back of the car, I scream in cold terror as I slam my foot down on the accelerator. The figure vanishes into the pitch darkness as the red of the brake light disappears, and I tear away through the forest faster than ever before. He's following the car. He's following me. The car lurches and crunches over the potholes and the gaps in the surface of the road, and I slam my brake as I prepare to bring the car around the corner. My eyes shoot up to the rearview mirror, looking out into the expanse of red-lit forest behind, and from the darkness, the rough silhouette of the figure appears, drifting across the road's surface as a living shadow. He's coming for me. Blood rushes and pounds in my ears. I hit a particularly deep bump 
and the radio starts hissing as pure static and then cuts out completely. I pass by the twisted old tree. I drive over the two chalk eyes and around the corner I go. And I'm just right back here, right back at that same damn sharp turn and that clearing. I slam my hands against the steering wheel in frustration. The clearing is empty though this time. And why wouldn't it be? The figure is not there. The figure follows on behind, drifting like a nightmare up the road. I dread to think what would happen if he were to reach me. What was it that happened at the end of your nightmare, I think to myself. But the answer, as before, eludes me. I just bring the car around, slow around the turn, occasionally tapping the brake with a violently shaking foot. And every time I do, the black silhouette of the figure appears in the rearview mirror in the center of the red road, inching closer, closer and closer. I consider switching the car into reverse. As suddenly as possible, I imagine the engine roaring as the car is hauled backwards, slamming into the figure. But would that be so wise? The figure is trying to reach the car. Would such a tactic give it exactly what it wants? I don't know what to do. And so, my panic simply cycles around and around, around and around, as I repeat this little loop of road in the depths of the forest. The stretch of straight, the twisted tree, the two chalk eyes, the sharp bend, and the empty little clearing. I drive my car through the forest, and the figure follows on behind. Think, God damn it! I shout out loud, knuckles white on the wheel. There has to be a way out. There is always a way out. I glance around the car, looking for an idea. I consider driving off the road and trying to navigate through the trees. A part of me even considers stopping the car. A morbid curiosity as to what might happen. But no. It's the eyes. The chalk eyes on the road. The first eye open. And the second closed. I shake my head with a weak laugh. Surely not. Is that how I escape? How I break the loop? The loop is the same. I see the twisted tree emerge through the darkness, its branches caught in the glare of the headlights, and then around the corner I go, back past the eyes and the steep clearing. But what if I don't see it? It's a stupid plan, and yet it somehow makes some unfortunate sense. I press down on the accelerator, the engine whirs as I drive us down the length of the long straight, and it's here that I press the brake, as I sense the end approaching. I slow the car right down, I do my best not to look in the rearview mirror. I just close my eyes, I slam them tight shut as the chalk commands, and like a lunatic, I drive my car completely blind. I see nothing. I hear only the rumble of the engine and the wind in the trees outside. I try to remember how the end of the road is supposed to go. A little further, a little further. My car's proximity sensors start to beep, and with a cold grimace, I carefully bring the wheel around to the right, and I feel the car turn with me. The end of the straight is supposed to turn onto a winding bind, one not quite as steep as the one before it. How does it go? I edge the car through the darkness. The engine growls softly and the car bumps as I drive over a pothole. I can't be going any more than 10 or so miles per hour at this point. My hands shake and sweat dangerously as I try to force the image of the figure out of my mind. I try not to think about his gradual, terrifying approach. The car's proximity sensors go off again. Little warnings from the dashboard tells me to bring the wheel back over to the left. A little further around this next turn. It's difficult to tell, but I think I'm making progress. My heart soars. There's no way that I'm actually driving across the sharp bend right now. There's no way. A little further. And at last, I dare to open my eyes. The headlights of the car reveal all around me thinning trees. The road up ahead winds around the way it's supposed to, through the hills. Yes, I shout out loud. I did it. 
I've broken the loop. I tap the brake and glance feverishly up to the rearview mirror. The dim red glare reveals the hooded figure standing directly behind the car, inches from the glass. My elation evaporates at once as I slam the pedal and the car begins to tear away, screeching and squealing against the road as the figure disappears into the darkness of the void. I tear chaotically around the remaining corners and past the final trees, an almost literal weight released off my chest as I see the glow of the streetlights up ahead. I bring the car around in a frantic turn and join the main road with the sound of skidding rubber and tarmac. As I drive away, I shoot one final look up into the rearview mirror, and I see him. The hooded figure stood completely still at the edge of the forest. He grows smaller and smaller in the distance behind me, but I do catch sight of him turning around on the spot and drifting back between the shadows of the trees, his body rigid all the while. I don't drive back that way ever again. I take the extra hour detour for the next couple of weeks until the roadworks have cleared up and I can finally take my regular route home from work. I didn't sleep well those first few nights after my encounter with a figure in the forest. I didn't sleep well at all. And I'll tell you what else. I had that nightmare again. The one in which I broke down in the middle of the woods. You know how dreams are. It's difficult to follow a plot, or a thread, or a flow. But in my dream, I remember being alone. Totally, completely alone. And I remember a little more too. In my dream, I left the vehicle to check the hood. I became distracted. I became lost. One minute the car was there, and the next it was gone. I remember the terror, the fear of being watched from the shadows between the trees. I remember drawing the chalk eyes on the road. I'm not sure why. And I remember waiting. Waiting, knowing that eventually I would come by. That I would try this route and I would be rescued. Wait, no, that doesn't make sense. And I remember the hooded figure. Figures shifting and shimmering in the darkness, drawing towards me as one. I awoke, drenched in sweat, each and every time. And it haunts me, knowing that whatever it is, is still out there, watching, waiting for me, from the darkness of the trees. I suffer from cystic fibrosis. It's a disease that, among other things, makes breathing difficult. I was first diagnosed with it as a child after the first of many late night emergency room visits. Living with CF means that while I have the potential to live a full and relatively decent life, it's nowhere near guaranteed. My parents were heartbroken when they got the news. Although they'd never told me themselves, I had learned that they had a hard time conceiving before I came along. They had tried every trick in the book, fertility drugs, dieting, specialists, clinical treatment, you name it, they tried it. Eight years with no luck, only to be delivered a sickly baby that wouldn't make it to 20. To say they did everything they could to keep me safe was an understatement. I was like a figure in a snow globe, caged in a bubble for my own protection. I know my parents loved me. They loved me so much it swallowed them up and ate them whole. Which is why I feel so guilty. Knowing that you're the root of every ounce of pain, every bit of worry and fear in your loved one's lives is a punishment I would never wish upon my worst enemy. I remember our first visit. I remember feeling the tears fall on my face as my father held me in his arms, frantically screaming at the nurse for help. Even now, I remember how fast this heart was beating against my cheek. We already knew. The pastoral draining technique was practically second nature to us, but it had never been this bad. My oxygen-deprived brain was struggling to keep up as those hospital lights flooded my vision. I was swimming in a fluorescent ocean as the doctors worked to clear my mucus-coated airways. Through the sea of white and the incoherent speech 
that my brain was working overtime to try and decipher, I heard my parents' sobs as they stood in the hallway, too horrified to look at me. All the anesthesia in the world couldn't stop the hurt I felt in that moment. This, more or less, would become my routine. I was what they called a frequent flyer at the hospital. I knew the nurses on a first name basis. I even had dinner with some who had come to visit and check in while I was first staying there. I come to befriend the people who shared rooms with me. But as one after another grew weaker, I learned better. My life was split between pajama clad stretchers at home and stints in a gown at the hospital. To say things were a bit dull at times wouldn't do it justice. Dreaming was my only escape. Sure, I had hobbies and things to do in the real world, but in the dream world, I was thrown into a new and exciting realities that I had absolute control over. Worlds where I didn't constantly have to be operated on. Living lives that truly made me feel free. I lived a life where my parents didn't have to worry, where they weren't sad anymore. In lucid dreaming, my life was saved. It was the sleep paralysis that killed me. I had my run-ins with REM sleep hallucinations, nightmares that lasted full nights and visions that haunted me. It wasn't so much the images that scared me, it was the lack of control as your body becomes lead and how slowly time moves as you suffer that silent eternity. The first time it happened, I cried when I woke up. I vowed to never do it again as long as I lived. For a while, I was successful. As the days grew duller, the stints grew longer, and my parents struggled to conceal their bottomless sadness, I gave in. I crawled into that bed and let the void swallow me whole just for a chance of escape. I wish, with every fibre of my being, I could have held out for just a little bit longer. Every day seemed to become a new challenge. Reoccurring lung infections seemed to become my new reality. News got worse, my lungs were fighting for every breath, and despite nightly attacks to my parents' hopelessness, no one could do a thing to help. As we went home that week, it was revealed to me that I would no longer have the privacy of my own room. Given the increasing severity of my attacks, my parents thought it best to sleep there with me in case the worst were to happen. I felt gutted. Now they couldn't enjoy a single night's sleep without my problems interfering and likely creeping into their dreams. As I saw them toss and turn, heard them talk in their sleep about their nightmares. Nightmares in which I was all that seemed present, all consuming, all powerful. I felt like the biggest burden alive. As I drifted off in that slumber, I wished for it all to just end. I didn't want to wake up anymore. I had just finished my reality checks as I slipped into that fresh dream when I felt a familiar pull. In an instant, everything seemed to be fading away. The ground beneath me seemed to give way as my edges became fuzzy. I was waking up. As the world went dark, my eyes fluttered open and I was paralyzed once more. The room was dark. The only light that faded in seemed to be coming from the bathroom down the hall. I took a deep breath as I tried to steal myself for the monsters that always came. At least, I tried to. The mucus that coated the walls and passages of my lungs had blocked my airways. I was choking in my sleep. I looked frantically around my room for help. It was my mother's turn that night, and as my eyes fell on that empty sleeping roll, I realized I was alone. I quickly put two and two together and realized with a sinking stomach that she was the reason why the bathroom light was on. I was a prisoner of my mind, desperately trying to snap out of it so that I could call for help. I felt the veins of my eyes bulge as the lack of oxygen set in. The shadows crept in around me as the sounds of blood rushing in my ears were slowly coming to a halt. In that dimly lit room, as I lay dying, he came. From the darkness crept a tall, shadowy figure. He seemed to waltz into the room to the slowing beat of my heart. Although I could only see the rims of his eyes, I could see that twisted grin growing slowly clear as day. I could feel his sharp nails 
as he climbed onto my bed, slowly eclipsing my body as he did. Pain shot through everything he touched like static. His hand seemed to envelop me completely as his fingers gripped my flesh. What's the matter? He spoke, his voice sounding as if someone had torn their vocal cords in every way possible. Can't sleep. With that, he let out a laugh and shook the room. His laughter sounded like nails on a chalkboard, mixed with a deep guttural growl that seemed to compound an echo in every nook and cranny of the room. Giggling, he craned his head against my chest and listened with glee, quietly indulging himself on my heart's final beats. Once it had stopped completely, he snapped his head upwards to face me. His small, black beady eyes sat in impossible deep sockets. Uh-oh, he rasped. I think it's broken. He licked his lips as he leaned in towards me, inches from my face. Don't worry, I know exactly how to help. I felt his nails dig into my flesh as he hoisted me up and threw me over his shoulder, cackling as we ran into the darkness that engulfed us both. I felt his every step roughly collide as it hit the dirt. As he dashed, I felt myself slowly slipping from his hold as we moved further and further along. It hadn't been more than ten feet before I fell hard and fast onto the sharp black floor. He stopped, if only to comically mine an overzealous oops. I rolled in fearful sweat as I hit the dirt and realized I could move my body again. As I clawed at the ground in an attempt to crawl away back into the light of my room, I could hear him walking towards me, his pace quickening. I reached and took hold of a nearby branch to defend myself with. As my fingers wrapped around that slippery surface, I pulled it close, only to scream in horror. In my hands, I held what was left of a femur. The chunks of rotten flesh and dead skin where I gripped it tight coated my hands as the maggots exploded outwards and crawled at my arms. I dropped the thing, but before I could react any further, I felt the man grab me by my feet and drag me onwards. Chunks of bone and flesh swam around me, and as we went, I felt myself grow sticky with a blood that oozed out as I collided with that putrid debris. I tried to scream, but whenever I opened my mouth, chunky metallic tasting fluid pushed itself down my mouth and blocked my throat. I coughed, gasping for air, as I tried to spit the gore out and felt myself get thrown into the air. It was as if I was inside a cone. Onward stretched on a warm red light, the floor seemed to curve in a complete circle and defy gravity for these creatures. All around us were more of these things, some dragging their own captives deeper into the light and some deciding they'd rather feast than the less fortunate wherever they stood. The screams and groan laughter echoed on endlessly. That's about all I could take in before I collided with the ground my skull slamming against the bile-covered floor in a whiplash. My heart was a piston, threatening to burst out of my ribcage at any second. I felt the man yank me to my feet by my arm. I smelt the burning flesh before I saw it. I recognized them immediately. Inside that fiery hole was a mix of strangers and friends from the hospital. Here, I was reunited with the long dead patients I had shared rooms with. The departed hung stone-faced as they dangled on hooks, needles weaving in and out of their skin like maggots. I saw old doctors of mine begging with outstretched arms to those who hung above them as they burned and writhed in agony. I couldn't take it anymore. I begged for him to let me go, to take me home and let me see my parents. He cackled as he pulled me close to his face. I realized now that his skin was a sickly gray, his body emaciated with two large oozing holes in the middle of his chest. I could see the veins in his arms twist and connect along his wasted body like tubes. I stared deep into those black sockets as I fought for him to let me go. But my dear, he grinned, I thought this was what you wanted. He let me go and motion to the suffering before us. Here, where you're not a burden, where the ones that failed you and pumped you full of hollow promises meet their retribution. Here, 
where you're free from the pain of sickness, a place in all your dreaming of your own creation. I stood in disbelief, tears welling in my eyes. How dare you? I croaked shakily. I would never, ever dream of this. Why in the hell would I ever make a place so awful? Why would I let such horrible hurt and torture ever happen? Tears had begun to well at the brink of my eyes as he stared at me. For the first time, I saw his smile disappear. He stood silently for a moment as his face drifted in thought. Nightmares, he began. Our dreams too, child. Where do you think you went as your frail body was forced to slumber while their blades cut you open and tubes slithered and made a nest of your organs? Her sickness is intangible, but his casualties are not. As you witnessed your friends leaving bags, did the bitterness and betrayal in their last moments as they were abandoned to die ever escape you? What do you believe became of all the resentment and anger you felt as those lab coats, in all their knowledge, filled your veins with false hope, only for them to slowly give up on you? In all your time awake, you drowned in anguish at the thought you were torturing the ones you loved most simply by existing. Is it that far-fetched that in a world shaped by your experiences at the invisible hands of fate, your true feelings would create a world that reflected your deepest desires? Tears fell from my eyes as I stared at him. My knees trembled as they gave in, and I sank to that cold floor. If what he said was true, there was only one thing I could think to ask. With quivering lips, I shakily asked, Am I in hell? I watched as he kneeled down to face me. The screams of pain fell to a hush as all the eyes in the room fell upon us. Only the sound of the crackling fire filled the air. No such thing, child, he whispered, slowly pointing a withered finger between my eyes. The only world that exists is the world you birthed in here. As I felt that familiar pull take me back, he was the last thing I saw. As my eyes fluttered open and adjusted to those bright hospital lights, I felt my lungs expand once more. I had come to learn that my mother had walked in on the tail end of things. She had screamed when she saw my eyes bulge and roll into the back of my head, waking up my father and causing him to rush in. If he hadn't picked me up and driven me like a bat out of hell to the hospital, I wouldn't have made it. The nurses had dropped me onto the table and struggled to stabilize me and start my heart again. I was unresponsive and the general consensus from the doctors was that I was brain dead in a coma. My parents had just finished screaming their heads off when I finally woke up. As they took me in their warm arms, they sobbed, blubbering about how they thought I had died. The doctors had called it a miracle. As any good hospital would, they nursed me back to health and examined me physically and mentally to see if any damage had occurred to me as I was transported and resuscitated. I had passed all the mental assessments and everything seemed normal. Everything, except for the marks on my arm. As the lab coats struggled to figure out where they could have come from, my blood froze. There, right where he had held me as he dragged my body into the darkness, stood the deep claw marks where he had drawn blood. I knew I'd made a mistake in coming, but I took a seat nonetheless. All of the Alcoholics Anonymous meeting on my side of town seemed warm and welcoming. All of the people were friendly and knew me by name. There were hugs, handshakes, slaps on the back. The rooms were well lit with comfortable chairs. There were always freshly baked cookies or donuts. A recent falling out with my sponsor, Ralph had caused me to choose to avoid some of my normal meetings though. I had already been down to two meetings a week, which Ralph had so poignantly called me to the carpet on, so I didn't want to cut those out completely. I had been feeling antsy lately and probably needed to go to a few more. Never the type to ask for help, 
I was unwilling to admit it though. Instead, I decided to try a few meetings on the other side of the tracks. Whitehall. The seedy part of town. Stupid Ralph. You're only as sick as your secrets, he said. I had made a list of all those I'd harmed and went about making amends to them all. Some accepted my apologies, some didn't. All I could do was clean on my own side of the street. There were a few amends that were impossible to make, but I had admitted all of my sins to either my sponsor, my therapist, or my priest. All but the one thing, that is. That's what Ralph kept harping on. I had stayed sober for 15 years. I deserved to keep the one thing to myself, didn't I? Stupid Ralph. I chose a group with the innocuous name of New Hope that met in the basement of St. Pete's Episcopal Church. While groups sometimes did actually meet in church basements, they were rarely as depicted on television or in the movies. That's just not the way things worked. Hollywood had gotten the coffee and donuts part down to a T, but missed the mark on most of the rest. Sadly, there weren't even any donuts of the New Hope group. I wish that I'd known. I would have sprung for some. AA had given me my life back and brought a good bit of financial security with it, so I don't mind giving back now and again. I made my way over to the coffee urn, making eye contact with a few people on the way. I didn't even bother to smile. The most I got was some grunts and shrugs as I walked by. I had already decided that I wouldn't ever be coming back to this group, so why bother? I wasn't about to walk out though. Giving up was for losers. I grabbed a styrofoam cup from the top of the stack, which already had some black smudge fingerprints on the outside, and filled it with a sludge that they called coffee here at St. Pete's. I threw a buck into the basket on the table and plopped into a chair that seemed to be farthest away from everyone else. This was nothing like the usual meetings I hit. The church's basement room was about 40 by 40 feet square. There were eight rectangular folding tables set up in a makeshift circle with wooden chairs set along the outside. Unfortunately, there would be no speaker. This was a discussion meeting. They would most likely read something out of some bit of AA approved literature, the big book, 12 and 12, or some meditation book, and then go around the room weighing in on their own personal experience, strength and hope. I didn't feel like talking, but the one bit of my sponsor's advice that I had latched onto early was to always say something, always be part of. Even though the ceiling held banks of fluorescent lights, the room still seemed cold Perhaps it was the type of bulb they used. Were they different types? Or perhaps it was the way the light reflected of the sickly yellow linoleum floor and institution green walls. It smelled funny too. Oh well, I thought. It's only for an hour. I had spent twice that amount of time scraping to get the change for another bottle while fighting off the shakes in the past. In comparison, this would surely be more pleasurable than that. That's what it came down to, wasn't it? For me, to drink is to die. There were times that I had done the most disgraceful things in order to get drunk. Things that would have sickened me if I had been sober and not fiending for the next drink. So, if sitting through a boring meeting in a crappy place meant not drinking, even for only an hour, then so be it. Not a difficult choice. I am not a snob but I thought that people there seemed to be a little lower class than what I was used to. I'm by no means rich, but by now I've gotten my life together. I'm back in the upper middle class demographic. The meetings that I attended were regularly frequented by businessmen, doctors, realtors, and other professionals. Frankly, even the blue collar people at my normal meetings seemed to be upper class compared to these people. These people were... And I have to remind myself that I was being honest and not uncaring. The dregs of society. Unshaven, unkempt, tattooed, greasy, foul-smelling. AA had taught me not to judge. 
There, but for the grace of God, go I. Still, it was hard. Just before the meeting was called to order, a man plopped down into the chair next to me. Oh, come on, buddy, I thought. Ten empty chairs, plenty to keep enough distance between all of us, and you have to sit right next to me. I sighed. At least this guy seemed friendly. Short, stout, PC for a beast, with a red, round face. He introduced himself. Hi there, name is Mike. How about you? Danny, I said, as I extended my hand. At least Mike was dressed well. Button-down shirt, slacks, dress shoes. He was even wearing cologne. Or was it the smell of booze? No, I decided it was cologne. The guy's breath smelled bad, though. Not smelled, as in drinking smelled, but just reeked. His teeth seemed white enough, but it was as if he hadn't brushed in ages. Mike tried to make small talk. I haven't seen you before. How long have you been coming to these meetings? About 16 years, I replied. I came in for a year and then decided that I wasn't ready to stop. I went back out for a while and have been sober ever since. 15 years, one month, one week, and two days. Wow. Mike seemed truly amazed. How many minutes? I just smiled. Me? Mike continued. I've only been coming for about a month now. I'll have 30 days on Wednesday. Well, congratulations. For some people, those first 30 days are the hardest. Real white knuckle time. Mike was definitely pink clouding it. That's the term for AAs in early sobriety who think that life has suddenly become wonderful and carefree. After a good period of sobriety, it kicks in that drunk or not, life still has challenges. There's just no more alcohol to make the bad feelings go away. I'll be getting my chip. Mike was of course referring to the coloured aluminium medallion that, although not universally used, has become almost synonymous with AA. Sobriety coins themselves do not help people stay sober as much. It's the meaning behind them that is important. When a person receives a coin for one month, three months, or a long period of time, the coin gives a sense of pride for staying sober as long as they have, and to motivate them to continue. If a person should feel the desire to drink again, they might finger the coin in their pocket to remind them of all the headway they have made up to that point. It makes them ask themselves if they truly want to throw away all that progress. I never liked the chips. I would occasionally step back and remember exactly how much sober time I had. Remember that last drunk vividly. But I didn't want a constant reminder. I felt it would make it easier to ask the question. Has it been long enough? Am I cured now? The conversation was surprisingly pleasant enough, but I was happy when the meeting began all the same. Same old, same old. Business first, then reading, then around the table sharing. When eight o'clock rolled around, the chairperson indicated that it was time to close, and they joined hands for the Lord's Prayer. AA is not a religious organization, but saying the Lord's Prayer at the end is sort of a tradition in most, but not all, groups. It's a sign of unity, if nothing else. I really didn't plan to stick around for fellowship afterwards, but I always stayed long enough to help clean up. However, before I got to the door, Mike cornered me. Hey, I... Am I going to see you around here again? Eh? Hey? I pulled a face. Probably not. I live on the other side of town. I just stopped here tonight because, well, it was convenient. I guess that had not technically been a lie. AAs had to be careful. Practice these principles in all of our affairs. Lies paved a slippery slope. Oh, Mike seemed dejected. It's just that they say to get phone numbers. You know, to call for when you feel like drinking. And I was wondering if I could get yours. My shoulders relaxed a little. Of course, Mike. That's never a problem. Never feel like you can't use it. Mike wouldn't use it. Most of the newbies never did. I pulled out a pen and jotted it down in the back of Mike's meeting pamphlet anyway. There you go. 
Thanks, Danny. Mike shook the pamphlet. I would definitely use this. You're a lifesaver. You guys are great. Mike bounced away. I made my way out into the parking lot and slipped behind the wheel of my 2012 Kia. I said a little prayer for Mike. Hope he makes it. Who knew? Maybe being at that meeting was God's way of putting him in the right place at the right time. I rolled through the Burger King drive through on the way home to pick up an artery-clogging dinner. I just wanted to flick on the television, eat, shower, and get to bed. It had been an exhausting day. I had barely pulled into my garage when my cell phone began to jingle. I finished parking, unbuckled my seatbelt, and answered the phone right there in the front seat. It was an old habit, probably not a healthy one, but I just had to pick up the phone when it rang. I could not bear the thought of someone leaving a message. I had heard stories of AAs who were never able to get through to someone, and things didn't turn out well. Once their faith in the system was broken, especially the newcomers, they didn't trust it anymore. Hello? Dano, it's Mike! Uh... I shifted the phone to my right ear. What's up, Mike? Oh, no, 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 no. Don't worry, Dan. I'm not thinking of drinking. Just wanted to test out the number. Practice call, you know. They say to get used to calling when you don't need to, and that way, it'll be easy to call when you need to, right? Um, yeah, Mike. That's a great idea. So, what's up? Um, well, not a whole lot since I saw you. I drove home. That's about it. I said with a smirk on my face. I'm about to have some dinner, and then it's off to bed. Oh, okay. Mike replied. You have your dinner and get a great night. Maybe I'll talk to you tomorrow. Sure, Mike. Tomorrow. I showered, toweled off, and padded into my bedroom. I slid into a pair of silk boxes and fell into bed. I didn't imagine that I would have any problems sleeping. I was physically exhausted, but as usual, my mind raced a mile a minute. I was never able to fall asleep without the radio turned on, even when I was ready to pass out. My head would hit the pillow and the stinking thinking would kick in. That's how I discovered the wonders of talk radio. Dialed into a pundit, recapping the day's news in a soothing voice, I pulled the chain of my bedside lamp and plunged the room into darkness. The pillow was cool, my stomach was full, my mind had calmed. Sleep began to... My phone jingled. I propped myself up on one elbow, used the remote to turn off the radio and grabbed the phone from the nightstand. Its screen lit up with the number of the incoming call, but I didn't recognize it. It wasn't a name that had been programmed into my phone. I briefly considered putting the phone back down and letting it go to voicemail, but I knew that I would not be able to sleep until I heard the message and, more than likely, called whomever it was back. Mm, I sighed. Hello? Danny? Mike sounded grave this time. Sorry to call so late. I mean, I know you said that you were going to hit the hay, and I didn't want to bother you, but... It's okay, Mike. Go ahead. Remember how I said that I'd be getting my chip in a couple of days? Yeah. I can't believe it'll have been a month already. You know, the day I took my last drink was a special day. Every day is a special day when it's your last drunk day, Mike. Yeah, yeah, but I mean special. It was the anniversary of... Well... Mike began to get flustered. See, my wife and I, my ex-wife that is, and I, lost our daughter that day. I swung my legs out from under the covers and sat up. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, don't be Danny. It happened so long ago. Long time ago. It would have been a 21st birthday. Mike trailed off. So long ago. The denial, the depression, the sadness, the anger. I started drinking afterward and just never thought to stop. Until now, that is. That's a long time to be stewing in it, Mike. Do you want to talk about it? Nah, Danny. No sense dredging up the past. 
Not when I'm doing so well. You're only as sick as your secrets, Mike. God, I hated it when my sponsor was right. Yeah, yeah. Maybe when I'm feeling a little more stable, Danny. Maybe I'll talk about it then. I'm just not doing so well right now. I spoke with Mike for about half an hour, and when I was convinced that Mike was over the urge to drink, let him off the phone and promised to meet him the following day. I laid down my phone and swung back under the covers, a smile on my face. What was it they say? Even if Mike went out and drank that night, at least I stayed sober. Help yourself by helping others. I forgot to turn the radio back on, and that night, I dreamt about the one thing. I awoke to the sound of my phone. It wasn't the alarm tone, but the ringtone. Another call. I had come to recognize Mike's number by now. This was getting a little annoying, but sometimes that's the way it went. Mike would either fall off the wagon soon, or he would start to make new contacts. In the meantime, I would just have to deal with it. Good morning, Mike. Dan, my man. Good to hear your voice. Yeah, I said, scratching the back of my head. It's been like six or seven hours now, huh? Oh yeah, I'm not bothering you, am I? No, no. Yes, yes, I thought. So, how did last night go? Didn't drink, did you? Nope, and I owe it all to you, Dan. Well, Mike, you picked up the phone and made the call, so you can give yourself a little pat on the back. That phone can seem real heavy when it stands between you and a drink. Ain't that the truth? So, are you hitting the meeting this morning? Um, no, Mike. I have a job. I tried not to sound ticked off. I have to work today. I promise that we'll get to one tonight. You pick it out and call me back around six, okay? Got it, Dano. Six. Talk to you then. My worst fear came true. Three more calls during the day. Mike had picked a group called, as Bill sees it, on my side of town. I decided that I would need to have a talk with Mike that evening. Calling when in need or even for occasional friendly support was fine. But there was such a thing as abusing the system. You know, the boy who cried wolf sort of thing. I was about ready to throw my always answer the phone policy out the door. I didn't look forward to the conversation and had a rough time forcing my dinner down that evening. I wasn't hungry, but as usual, I tried to keep my stomach full. Halt, H-A-L-T, hungry, angry, alone, tired. Four things an alcoholic never wanted to be. Any of those could be a setup for another drink. As I was finishing my second hot dog, wrapped in white bread with ketchup, just as I liked them, my phone rang again. I checked the screen. Bloody Mike. Again, I decided that I wouldn't answer it and let it go to voicemail. Seconds later, it rang again. Didn't that guy get the message? I let it go to voicemail again. Another few minutes passed, and it rang again. I wondered if Mike had changed his mind. Maybe he couldn't make it to the meeting after all. Still, I let it go to voicemail. Thankfully, more minutes passed, and Mike did not call back. I felt like a heel, but I just couldn't deal with it anymore. At around a quarter of seven, I tied my shoes and gathered my wallet and car keys. As I headed to the door, my phone jingled. Mike. This time I answered. Hey Mike, I'm heading out the door right now. Oh thank God, Dan, exclaimed Mike. I couldn't get a hold of you, and then I started to worry. I wondered if maybe you went out drinking again. I, I, Mike, slow down, buddy. I was beginning to let my temper get the best of me. Would you... Oh, look, just wait for me at the meeting. Outside, we need to talk. Mike was breathing more regularly now. Oh, Danny, you really had me going there. Well, anyway, you can ride with me. What? I strode out of the back door and pressed the button to lift the garage. As the door rolled up, it gradually revealed a battered, green Honda sitting in the drive. 
Mike sat behind the wheel with the engine idling. I was taken aback. I walked briskly up to the driver's side door and motioned for Mike to lower the window. After a moment, with a confused look on his face, Mike hit the button and the window glided down. What's wrong, Dan? Hop in. I thought that maybe we could ride to the meeting together. Then maybe grab a cup of coffee after, huh? I was fed up. No, no, Mike. No meeting, no coffee after. I don't have time for this. I don't know what to do with you. You cannot keep calling me. How the hell did you even find where I live? Oh, uh... Mike looked shamefacedly. I guess maybe I, uh, followed you home last night? What the hell? Sorry, Dan. I'm new at this. I really don't know how it works. How it works? Having a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. I thought it over and softened. Okay, Mike, here's how it goes, I said calmly. I'll come to the meeting, but I drive there myself. We talk a little. After the meeting, I come home alone. No coffee, no more calling, unless you really need to. Like, I'm going to drink need to. Are we clear? Mike looked a little hurt, but replied, Okay, clear, Dano. I got into my Kia and followed Mike to the meeting. We sat next to each other, but Mike was uncharacteristically quiet. Afterward, we separated in the parking lot with a nary word. See you tomorrow, Danny. Maybe. Oh, hey, said Mike. There's a candlelight meeting called Night Owls tonight at the... All right, sorry. Tomorrow, Mike, I stressed. I thought that Mike may have gotten the message, but just in case... I turned my phone off for the evening, for what was probably the first time in years. That night, I had a nightmare about the one thing. I pulled myself from bed and showered in the morning, and had almost forgotten my phone. Still wrapped in a towel with damp hair, I walked over to the nightstand and turned it on. I returned to the bathroom as it went through the boot-up process, and then I heard a message tone from the next room. Hmm... Wonder who that could be. Six missed calls from Mike. One, two voicemails, four texts. Thanks for coming, Dan, said one. Sure you don't want to go to the meeting, said another. Great meeting, should have been there. And, need to talk. I didn't want any confrontation today. I turned my phone back off, dressed and left home. I knew, just knew, that Mike would show up at my door after not receiving answers for long enough. I planned to not be there. Even though it was a Saturday, I would hang out at my office. There was a couch there. I could take a nap if need be, and I did need it after the previous night. I felt silly and demoralized. It was my own house, damn it. I was being chased away from my own home by, well, a stalker. Should I call the police? No, I decided. I would talk to my sponsor first. Not daring to turn my cell back on for fear that it might ring in my hand. Upon arriving at my office, I picked up my desk phone and dialed in Ralph's number. Ralph was no help. At least, he didn't tell me what I wanted to hear. Just suck it up. I've had my share of pigeons who either tried too hard or didn't try hard enough. My guess is that this Mike guy will turn out to be one or the other. Why don't you bring him along to tonight's meeting? I'll meet you guys at the acceptance group tonight. Maybe I can have a talk with him. Yeah, I suppose. I turned my cell back on in order to call Mike and invite him to the acceptance group that evening. Six missed calls, and it was barely noon. I sighed and began to scroll to Mike's number when my phone jingled. I didn't even need to look at the number to know who it was. Hi, Mike. Danny, I tried to... Yeah, I know, Mike. I've been at work. I just turned my phone on and saw that you were called. An icy thought ran down my spine. Did Mike know where I worked too? Anyway, my sponsor suggested that I introduce you to him tonight. We're going to St. Andrews to a meeting called The Acceptance Group. 
Want to come? Are you kidding? Do you even need to ask? I would never pass on the chance to meet my sponsor's sponsor. He's like, what, my grand sponsor? Whoa. I thought about it, and never had the talk of me being Mike's sponsor come up. A sponsor is a recovering alcoholic who has successfully made some personal progress in the AA recovery program. He or she is asked by another AA member to take on the individual responsibility of sponsorship. A sponsor shares their experiences on an individual and personal basis with another alcoholic who is trying to achieve or maintain their own sobriety through the AA program. They help the person focus and navigate through the stages of the program. The relationship between an AA member and his sponsor is usually a pretty close and intimate one, and not gone into lightly. Not only does an alcoholic need to carefully choose a sponsor, but also the potential sponsor must cautiously decide whether taking on a sponsee is prudent. I gave him the benefit of the doubt though. Mike was new at this. Hey now Mike, I'm just another alcoholic willing to help you out. I'm not really in the right state of mind to sponsor anyone. Not until I rid my conscience of the one thing anyway. Oh, okay. Don't feel bad Mike, you're new. You'll catch on to how this works. Then I had the thought. One that might rid me of Mike for good. Ralph really helped me out. Maybe he'd be a good choice for you to consider. Eh, he won't be the same as you, Dan. You'd be surprised. We're all the same in one way or another. Promise me that you'll keep an open mind. Okay, anything for you, Dano. I hung up and texted directions to the meeting. Then I turned my phone back off. I decided on trying to catch a little nap after all, and so curled up on the couch in the reception area of my office. I drifted off almost immediately, but it didn't last long. I awoke screaming and in a cold sweat just 45 minutes later, I felt my face and realized that I'd been crying also. I had dreamt of the one thing. Why thoughts of it returned and in such force? Damn Ralph. He brought it up and started pressing me. That would make sense. Although, I had a feeling that Mike had something to do with it. Guilt over avoiding him? Constantly having to look over my shoulder and avoid phone calls? Or perhaps the fact that Mike had lost his daughter? I pushed the one thing to the back of my mind once again and decided to cross the street to McDonald's to get in at least one meal before that evening's meeting. I had to cross a four-lane street in order to reach McDonald's. It was the middle of the afternoon, clear weather, and being a Saturday, there was only light traffic. I absentmindedly glanced in both directions and crossed, not bothering to walk the corner and wait for a signal. I was about halfway across when, seemingly out of nowhere, a car came racing at me. The driver was noticeably straddling the double strip center line of the road and overcorrected when he noticed me at the last moment. I could hear the tires screech as the driver got back into his own lane and sped off. A drunk knew the signs when he saw another drunk driving under the influence. This guy was definitely drunk. Probably drinking in his car all morning and then falling asleep at the wheel after finally deciding to go home. I'd done it myself on many occasions. Even though I could have stayed home and drank contently and safely in the comfort of my living room, I would choose to sit at a park on some mornings and drink in my car. I thought of how strange the ritual was and how it was not unique to me. On any given morning, there would be a spattering of cars in each lot, all parked as far away from each other as a lot would allow, each car with a single occupant, seemingly just sitting there, every now and then would glance over and catch the sight of a bottle being raised to the driver's lips. Fred, another guy from one of the meetings, would occasionally go down to the local park and work it. He'd walk around the lots and catch drunks, pretending that he had just been walking by and was looking to make conversation. Sometimes his presence was enough to make the drunk drive away. Sometimes they'd stay and talk. Sometimes they would even offer him a drink. Only twice as far as I'm aware of did Fred actually get a drunk to open up about his problem and agree to take Fred's advice. It might not have seemed like a lot, but that may have been two lives saved. Plus countless others, if you figured in the innocent lives a drunk might take along with himself on the highway to hell. 
I began to hyperventilate. I ran the rest of the way across the street and sat on the curb, my gorge rising. I tried to calm myself, but could not. Eventually, I threw up in the gutter. It wasn't the first time, but in the past, I'd always been drunk or hungover. I realized how pitiful I must have looked. I'd never seemed to care in the past. Eating was out of the question. I went back to the parking lot of my office, crossing the street with extra care this time, and got into my car. I drove straight to the church. I would be almost an hour and a half early, but that was okay. Someone was always there early to open up the rooms and make coffee. It was nice to show up and chat sometimes. Not surprisingly, Mike was already there when I arrived. He was sitting out in the parking lot, but remained in his car. It looked like he was dozing. I walked over and rapped on the driver's side window a few times. Mike startled, and he rolled down the window. Danny, you're early. That's great. Yep. Couldn't wait to get here, Mike, I said sarcastically. Tell you what, let's go around back and grab a bench. I led Mike behind the church. There was a small outdoor chapel of sorts, just a few benches facing a large wooden cross and overlooking a small stream. I motioned for Mike to take a seat and then sat down next to him. Mike, let's talk. I felt surprisingly calm. I know that you're pretty new to the program, and this may be skipping ahead quite a bit, but let me explain how the fourth and fifth step of AA goes. They are, to me at least, probably the most important steps of all twelve. They are where you begin healing. Sounds great, Dan. Not really. I did a really bad job on my fifth step. Remember how I told you that you're only as sick as your secrets? Mike nodded. Yeah, Danny. The fourth and fifth steps ask you to make a searching and fearless moral inventory and then admit to God, ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. I can see where that would help. I have so much guilt and remorse, Danny. Sometimes I think it's what makes me drink. I shook my head. No, Mike, you drink because you're an alcoholic. But it's a whole lot easier to get sober when you get your head on straight. When you get rid of all that mess that's deep down inside, the stuff that regrets are made of. So, are we going to do that now? Not we. Me. I thought you already did your steps. I nodded. I did, Mike. I did. But the fourth and fifth steps are carried on throughout the rest. We have to continue to make a moral inventory and do those steps over and over because we are human. Just because we get sober doesn't make us saints. We still make mistakes. Mike nodded slowly and remained quiet. It was as if he knew that I was about to say something important, and it was time to keep his mouth shut. You see, Mike, there was something that I never admitted in my fifth step. Something that I couldn't admit. The one thing that I wasn't ready to give up. I don't know why, but it's catching up to me now. I'm afraid that if I don't let it go, I'm either going to drink or kill myself, or both. What is it, Dano? This is probably a mistake, telling a newcomer, especially about the one thing. In fact, this would be better left with a priest, but at this point, it doesn't matter because I'm going to have to own up to it. The one thing is something that everyone will find out about sooner or later, probably sooner now. You can tell me, Danny. Your secret is safe with me. Suddenly, it was as if Mike had become the old-timer. His demeanor changed. He surely didn't seem like a newbie anymore. The whole way he was acting, he had gone from being an annoying, overexcited asshole to a quiet, comforting soul, at least in my heart. I took a deep breath. I've been sober for about 15 years, one month, one week, and four days. I told you that I came into the rooms about 16 years ago, though. Well, something happened about six months into that. I'd been dry, sure, but still an alcoholic, still exhibiting all the same behavior. That's what the program is for, by the way. Not to make us stop drinking, but to make us saner, healthier people. Well, Mike, I... My breath hitched to my throat. I was already regretting bringing this up, but 
I felt it was too late now. Go on, Dano. I'm listening. It was late summer, around seven o'clock dusk. I was driving up Parkside Avenue. You know the place. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I used to live in a cul-de-sac off Parkside. Then, you know the hill, about midways. Anyway, I was coming up, over the crest of the hill, tooling along, pink clouding it, stone cold sober, mind you. A girl. A little girl, damn it. She came out from between two parked cars and just, just ran out in front of me. Oh god, Danny, no. Yeah, I couldn't stop it. I ran her down, Mike. A little girl. That's horrible, Mike grimaced. But it was an accident, Danny. You said so yourself. You were sober. She ran out from between the cars. You couldn't have known. No, but it was what I did next that was unforgivable. What then? Mike rocked back, laced his fingers together, and knitted his brow. He had a clear-headed look about him, one that I had never seen on Mike's face before. What was unforgivable? I took a deep breath. I didn't stop. I just kept on driving. I panicked. It was like I'd been drinking. I didn't want to get caught. Afterward, I realized that it was a mistake. At the time, I just panicked. I acted just like a drunk would have. I left her there, Mike. Maybe she was still alive. But I left her there. What if she was just hurt and could have been saved if I had just stopped? She was dead the instant you hit her, Dan. You couldn't know that. I didn't know that, and I was there. I do know it, Danny. That's what the EMT said. Dead on impact. I jerked my head up. It was as if my stomach had dropped out from under me, like the first hill on a roller coaster. What did you say? When I got there, that's what the EMT told me. Dead on impact. She didn't suffer. She probably had no idea what had happened. What the hell are you talking about, Mike? She was my daughter, Danny. I was speechless. I sat still for a moment and then started shaking my head violently. No, screw you, Mike. Her father is dead. I followed the story in the papers. He killed himself two months after the accident, got drunk and drove into a bridge. Why the hell would you even say something like that? Mike had tears welling up in the corners of his eyes. Because now I know, Danny. Now I know that you are ready to free yourself of the one thing. Screw you, Mike. How can you pull something like this? How can you even say something like that? Do you think that this is a joke? I stormed away, sobbing, and walked toward the church. Ralph had arrived and was walking in himself. He noticed how upset I was and stopped me, grabbing my shoulder and turning me around somewhat forcefully. Danny, what's wrong? What's going on? That asshole. I told him, Ralph. I told him the one thing, and do you know what he said? Slow down, Danny, said Ralph. If you're ready, why don't you tell me what the one thing is first? My secret is no longer a secret. I told Ralph exactly what I told Mike. And he said that he's a father, that dick. Who, Danny? Who? Mike, that idiot who's been harassing me. Where is he, Danny? Is he here? I'll talk to him. I turned and pointed at the bench. He was sitting right there. Ralph cocked his head. Danny, are you okay? No, I'm upset, and with good reason. I just told him the one thing, and he goes out and says that. Ralph's brow wrinkled with concern. Danny, I've been here for 20 minutes waiting for you to go inside. I saw you sitting there on the bench talking to yourself, and thought that you were praying or needed some time to yourself. You were alone the whole time, Danny. I scanned the parking lot. No battered green Honda. I started to breathe heavily and pulled out my phone. I scrolled through my call log. All of the calls I had made and received, all of the texts, nothing. The only call in the last three days was the one I had made to Ralph that same morning. There was one message waiting in my inbox. It had no number associated with it. I forgive you, Danny.
As I pulled up in front of the shop, I had to recheck my directions. It was a dingy little hole in the wall, stuffed between a Dollar General and a computer repair shop. It looked like it had just existed here since the creation of the first VHS tape. The windows were covered in thick yellow paper and the outside was caked in a film of old dirt. The sign on the door said open, but it was barely visible through the dirty window. There was no way this place had what I wanted. When I was a kid, I remembered watching a show on cable called Children of Men. As a kid, the premise of the show appealed to me. The show was about kids living on an island out in the Pacific, trying to survive day-to-day -day trials. The producers had gotten 40 kids from all over America, ages 10 to 12, and dropped them off with supplies and instructions on how to survive. The host, Chris Mansworth, was a survival expert, and he would create challenges every day for the kids to complete. There were four teams of 10 kids, and the winner of each challenge got something cool for their area of the village. I watched the show religiously as a kid, every Saturday night, right after The Simpsons. The show would come on, and I would be enthralled. I always imagined that I was on the island with them, surviving day to day. The challenges were also neat too. They had the kids gut and clean their own meat, dig wells by hand, build rafts for the raft race, and make aqueducts so their village could have running water. It was a neat idea, but the show just stopped after eight episodes. No new episodes came out, and the station never gave a reason. This was before the internet, and there was no way to check for updates online. So, the show slipped off into obscurity, and my ten-year-old self just forgot about it. I remember the show again a few years ago, when mom sent me a box of my stuff from the attic. There were a couple of old VHS tapes in there, and between Batman the Animated Series and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were eight tapes with handwritten labels that read, Children of Men. We had a VHS recorder when I was a kid, and I can remember recording my favourite shows to watch later. I was excited to get to see the old show again, the memories flooding back, and I started looking for a VHS player among the tapes in the box. There wasn't one, but a quick trip to Goodwill and $15, and I had a gently used VCR hooked up to my TV. I watched all eight episodes back to back and fell in love with the show all over again. I remember the kids I liked. Robert and Catherine were my favourites, but many of the kids had also been given a lot of screen time and it was hard not to like them too. As I watched, I found myself wanting to see how the show ended all over again. As I watched the show again, I began to notice something a little darker under the surface too, something I hadn't noticed as a kid. The village was divided into four teams, green snakes, bluebirds, red foxes, and brown mice. The teams had mostly been divided up by background, which seemed very divisive to me as an adult. The green snakes did most of the hunting for the village. A lot of their kids had a rural background, while the brown mice did most of the farming and gathering because they came from a farm background. The red foxes were in charge of construction and upkeep. They were the smarter kids, and they worked with the bluebirds, who were in charge of food management and cooking the meals. Every team had a representative who sat on a council. Robert sat for the green snakes, Catherine for the bluebirds, Marco for the red foxes, and Shireen for the brown mice. As the show went on, it became apparent that Robert didn't trust Marco, and with good reason. Marco and Shireen had formed a kind of alliance of their own, though most of it was because Marco bullied her into doing what he wanted. Robert and Catherine set up their own alliance, and Robert started holding out food to sway Shireen's decisions. The village needed food, and Robert pointed out that he and Catherine were the ones providing it. Robert and Catherine wanted a fair split for everyone, but Marco tried to split them into a class system that would put his foxes in the higher tier. Robert didn't like that, and it became clear that if Chris hadn't been there, we would have seen a lot more fights. Robert was a big 12-year-old, a stocky bruiser who won battles with his fist most of the time. 
and Chris had separated him from Marco more than once. Marco was smaller, but definitely had charisma. He had most of the mice and all of the foxes on his side, and I wasn't sure how I missed all this tension as a kid. It all came to a head in episode 6. Marco was caught hoarding food in the Red Fox village. It wasn't just food that the other teams had been bringing in either. He had been taking the comfort foods from the canteen the brown mice ran for the village and storing them in his hut. Robert discovered this and took Marco prisoner, demanding he be placed on trial. The whole village was in an uproar, but Marco agreed to be confined to a central cabin until the council could rule on his trial. Chris was setting up the whole trial as an episode 8 draw for viewers. At the end of episode 8, the council found Marco guilty, and the episode had ended with a lot of shaky camera work and the Red Foxes storming the podium where Marco was seated. That was how the show had ended. The little bell chimed overhead as I stepped into the tiny place. The store looked like a throwback, sharp looking rickety shelves that were covered in plastic VHS boxes and thick dust. The shelves held VHS tapes, Betamax and DVD cases that were arranged neatly amongst the filth and dust. A quick look showed that they were all in alphabetical order like some ancient library. The shelves fronted on a glass display case that held murky wonders within. On the counter was a television, an ashtray stacked with old butts, and the greasy store clerk who smiled at me as I approached. You the one who called about the tape? He asked, showing a mouthful of stained teeth. I had searched for months on my own. I had taken to the internet in an attempt to find something, anything that would give me some closure. Wikipedia told me that only 8 episodes were aired, but 12 had been intended. As I dug deeper, I began to see that the show was a mystery all on its own though. The list of children that had been in the show was woefully incomplete. Marco and Robert were there, so were Catherine and Shireen, and Chris the host, but none of the other children were even named. No one except Chris Mansworth had gone on to do anything after the show and his only contribution was his death a few months later. His wiki said that he had offed himself in his hotel room, and foul play was not suspected. As for the last four episodes of Children of Man, however, there was no mention. So, I took to the usual online sleuths, Reddit, 4chan, TV message boards. No one seemed to have the answer. Most people had never even heard of Children of Man, and the ones who had were more interested in my copies than the last four episodes. Apparently, the episodes were never compiled or released for purchase, and the only means by which the show still existed was on VHS tapes like mine. I had several offers for them. One guy wanted to give me $500 per tape, but I declined and told them I'd post copies of the tapes for free if they wanted. That's how I met Charleston Hammer, 462. He was a user on the hometown board of Reddit. He saw my post and the posted videos and got in contact with me about the place I was currently in. Heard you looking for a certain tape? In my line of work, when you're looking for something, you go talk to Reggie. He owns a shop in Burlington, South Carolina, called Video Time Capsule. If you want a banned episode of a 70s drama or a never aired documentary from the 60s, you talk to Reggie. I read the message a few times before responding. Thanks, Charleston, but these episodes aren't just unaired, they're unknown. No one has ever seen them. I don't even know if they exist, and the store you're talking about is over 400 miles away. I figured I'd never hear from him again when I hit send on the message. It took him an hour to respond. What you're after is very rare. I used to watch Children of Men myself when I was younger. It ended so abruptly that it's been an internet mystery since the net was just wells and message boards. I didn't learn about the last four episodes though, until I met Reggie at TV Con. We got to talking about old TV shows and, after a few drinks, he told me that he had the last four episodes of Children of Men. That piqued my interest. Have you seen them? That response took a little longer. I have. 
It's some pretty different stuff. I won't ruin it for you, but if you value the way you remember Children of Men, then don't watch it. There's a reason these episodes never made it to air. Here's the number to the store. If it's late, call him anyway. Reggie keeps weird hours, and sometimes that store is open 24 hours. He's an eccentric dude, don't doubt, but he has what you're looking for. The number was at the bottom of the message. Yeah, I said, no longer sure about what I was doing. Yeah, I called you about the complete series of Children of Men. He nodded and reached under the counter and slapped a plain white case on the counter. All eight episodes recorded at airing, he said, his eyes studying me. I frowned. I'm after the last four episodes. His picky eyes glinted behind the grease-smeared glasses. There were only eight episodes that aired. And you told me that you had the other four episodes that never aired. He smiled and did ghastly things to his porcine face. I had to be sure, come to the back. And with that, he disappeared behind a curtain into the back of the store. I walked around, hesitating for a moment as I touched the curtain and followed him. I'd come 400 miles. I might as well go another five feet into hell. The phone rang six times. I was just about to hang up when someone answered and spoke through a mouthful of food. I didn't understand him, but once he swallowed whatever had been in his mouth, he tried again. Video time capsule, where your memories are always on sale. What a tagline. Yes, I was looking for something specific. The sound of something being stuffed into the speaker's mouth and loud chewing assaulted my ears before he continued. Aren't they all? What you looking for? Clearly, customer service was not their strong suit. Episode 9-12 to 12 of Children of Men. I heard something hit the floor, and the speaker cursed loudly. Yeah, uh, you must be mistaken. There were only eight episodes of Children of Men. Look, I said a little hotly. I was told that you have things that no one else does. I want to see these episodes. I don't even want to buy them. And I was told that you have them in your possession. Is there any way that I can just... $500. The voice returned, and the tone was not one to be bargained with. In cash, before I'll even let you see him. I agreed. Despite the outrageous price, and now I was here in this grungy shop, prepared to go into the back. The back was worse than the front. DVDs and VHS tapes were stacked in teetering piles. The back room was lit by only a few dingy overheads, and I could see an old TV casting its glow from the back. The floor was riddled with trash, and I swear you could hear the mice scampering around to get out of my way. What sort of videos could I find here? Would this place give me anything but heartbreak? This seemed like a setup to a thousand scary stories, and I suddenly didn't want to see these mysterious artifacts. But, like anyone else who comes this close to finding the thing they want, I needed to see them. Reggie was waiting for me by the TV. He had an ancient set that looked very similar to the one my parents had owned. On top was a VHS DVD combo player and a set of rabbit ears that stuck out like a weather vane. There was a wooden chair in front of it with a little blue pad in it. Reggie held his hand out. 500, he said. How do I know it's authentic? Look, I could get in a lot of trouble for owning this, okay? This would put me in prison for life. If you want to see those episodes, then I need the money. Are we doing business here or what? I handed him the money, and he popped the cassette tape in and walked away. Not joining me? I asked. Not for another 500 bucks, kid. I heard the curtain rustle as the show began. Episode 9 gave us a recap of the trial and then the storming of the stage. When the show started, I noticed a distinct lapse in film quality. Whoever was operating the cameras was much shorter than the usual crew, and they seemed barely able to handle the heavy rig. Finally, the camera had Robert in frame, and he began to fill us in on what was happening in the village. 
It's been about three days since Marco's trial and his escape. Since then, Fox Village has been separated from our village. They took most of the brown mice with them, and now they try to raid us every night for food. Something is going on over there. We heard shouts this morning and... But at this point, the shouts got louder, and Robert ran off screen as the camera tried to follow him. We came to the edge of Red Fox Village. Many of the huts that were once on the verge had been burnt out, making a kind of barricade between them and the rest of the village. Many voices were cheering as something swung from the tree. At first, I thought it was an effigy, a dummy maybe, but then I realized that it was Shireen. She swung like a grotesque wind chime in the space between the villages, and Robert shouted for Marco to stop being a coward and come out. Some of the kids were crying, but everyone on the other side cheered and shouted, traitor or faithless at the swinging body of Shireen. I sat glued to the TV, unsure if any of this was even real. It was night when the next recording resumed. It seemed that whoever was running the camera wanted us to see the raid. The night vision on the cameras showed kids with torches fighting other kids who were leaving their storehouse in a hurry. The kids with torches hacked at them with machetes, blood flying as they connected, and some of them dropped as they were stabbed or hacked to pieces by the blades of the other children. The rest of the episode was mostly uneventful. Lots of shaky cam, lots of crying, and at one point, someone dropped it and didn't pick it up for several minutes. As the episode ended, I was left looking at my own stark face, looking back at me. What had I just watched? There was no way that could be the same show. Things had gone very Lord of the Flies in the village, and as the 10th episode started, I wasn't sure what to expect. Episode 10 started without preamble. There was no recap, no theme music, and the footage looked unedited. We see a much more professional camera crew and Chris Mansworth trying to bring some order back to the island. They're coming up through the shallows, Chris and about 10 adults coming up in the dark towards the village. Chris was talking about how this had gotten out of hand and how they were going to try rescue the children. As they came into the seemingly empty village, Chris cupped his hands and began to shout at the empty huts. He told them that the game was over and that it was time they went home. He told them there was a boat that would take them home. Still, no response. He moved deeper into the collection of straw huts, the fires burning low and around them, and that was when they struck. Kids with spears and machetes came screaming out of the darkness, and the cameraman backpedaled furiously as the adults were taken completely by surprise. Blood flew, legs were sawed off as the pint-sized savages hacked and chopped, and Chris Mansworth was buried under a pile of children as he screamed and flailed. As the cameraman tripped and went down, we see the shadows of children standing over him as the spears came down. The episode ended abruptly. I was speechless. What the hell had happened to them? These were kids that had been doing challenges and making friends. The rivalry between Robert and Marco had always been the most serious part of the show, but now they had devolved into savages. The 11th episode was about 10 minutes long. It opened on a stationary camera shot of the same space they had held the trial. Marco was on his knees before the camera, and he looked bad. His left eye was a puffy mass of bruised tissue. His left ear was a bleeding stump. His nose looked to be cut jaggedly. He was weeping silently, and his ears were thick and bloody. Robert stood behind him. He'd always worn a white football jersey in every episode I'd seen him in, but the garment was stained red and brown now. He bled from several places on his chest, and when he raised his machete, it was with obvious pain. This morning, before the sun has risen, this dog attempted to attack our village. He violated the rules of war as agreed up by he and I. We agreed to a battle between our two villages at dawn. This snake tried to attack us in the night, and lost. 
Thus, his village is forfeit. As the winner, I sentence him to death. Please, Robert. Chris Mansworth's voice can be heard off screen. The show is over. You can all go home now. Back to your parents. It doesn't have to end like this. As Marco cried his terrible tears, Robert looked at Chris off screen and turned back to Marco. The show is over. This is our home now. He brought the machete down. Marco cried out and fell face first to the ground. Robert fell on him, hitting him with the machete again and again. Blood sprayed from the struggling kid, and when Robert looked back to the camera, his face was splattered in gore. He reached out, and the camera went off abruptly. The last episode was only a few minutes. It started with a shaky cam journey through the jungle. The runner was being pursued. I could hear the footsteps behind him. As the runner got to the shore, he jumped into something and pushed out into the water. The wooden deck of a boat came into view, and as he drifted out, I could hear oars working in the water. He sat the camera on the seat, and as he rode, the faces of children could be seen in the surrounding jungle. Then, everything went dark. The tape clicked, and the TV went back to static. I left it in the VCR and stumbled out the back room. Reggie was sitting behind the counter and looking up at me with something like sympathy. He held something back towards me, and I saw... It was my money. I shook my head and stepped away from him. I'd bought a ticket, and I'd paid the price. You gonna be okay? He asked. Yeah, so what happened to the kids? They just left them there. Reggie shrugged. The Coast Guard picked Chris Mansworth up two days later. He was drifting in the ocean and looked extremely rattled. He wouldn't tell them how he had gotten out there, or where he'd been. When he got back, he gave the tapes to the studio, and the next time anyone saw him, he was dead. And the kids? The studio never pursued the show. They never sold the aired episodes. They never even tried to air what Chris brought back. They just made the whole thing disappear. I suppose there's an island out there, full of kids who went to be on a TV show and never came back. The parents were likely told there had been an accident or something. The whole thing was hushed up, and eventually people forgot. You'll forget one day too, he added, as though it might help. As I lay in bed now, trying to forget the horrible things I saw, I hope I do forget, but I doubt I ever will. So, if you happen to find an island out in the Pacific, maybe one full of locals that just don't look right. Turn your boat back out to sea. Those natives are not friendly. <laughs>